Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 10817 in the name of Michael Russell on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill at stage one. I would invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Michael Russell to speak to and to move the motion in his name. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. When I came to this chamber last week, I spoke of my regret that the government had had to take the step of introducing this continuity bill. Today, as we consider the general principles of the bill at stage one, I still regret the circumstances that have led the government to take this step. They still persist. We have yet to reach agreement on satisfactory amendments with the UK government in advance of a further meeting of the JMC EN tomorrow and the JMC plenary, that is the Prime Minister and the First Ministers, scheduled for the 14th of March. The First Minister set out in the Chamber last week the crucial issue of principle that divides the Scottish and Welsh governments from the UK government, that the consent of this Parliament should be required for any changes to our powers. I go into tomorrow's JMC EN, as the First Minister will go to the plenary next week, still working imaginatively and cooperatively to achieve the agreement that remains our aim. I will, of course, keep Parliament fully informed of developments, and indeed I sent a note to all members last night which included information of where things presently stood. Of course. Mike Rumbles. Why does the Henry VIII's powers in section 13 give ministers the power for 15 years to make regulations creating new public authorities without MSPs in this parliament having any ability to amend ministers' proposals in any way whatsoever? Is that not an assault on the powers of this parliament? Minister. Well, we have made very considerable changes to the powers as recommended by the UK government. Uh, I appeared before the Delegated Powers ye Committee yesterday and made it clear that we have met their objections that they raised with us almost entirety last year on the government bill. But I point out to Mr Rumbles, this is a stage one debate. If Mr Rumbles wishes to bring an amendment to the bill at stage two, which will be next week to consider that matter, the Chamber will have the opportunity to do so and I will defend the powers in the bill with uh, my usual vigour and I'm sure Mr Rumbles will argue against them with his usual vigour. So um, we are now, of course, presiding officer, at the first key milestone in the passage of the continuity bill through this parliament. But though this is the first key milestone, it's far from the first parliamentary activity on the bill since introduction last week. As well as my own statement on the 27th of February, the Lord Advocate came to make his statement on the issue of legislative competence on the 28th of February. We then had a very full and I think interesting and constructive debate, in the most part, on the emergency bill procedure and timetabling on the 1st of March, even as the snow closed in all around us. And during that debate, the government was rightly challenged on its plans on how to maximise scrutiny of this bill, given the circumstances and timeframes within which we are operating. And Mr Rumbles was one of those who challenged vigorously on that issue. Members, I hope, are now aware that of the arrangements that are being proposed as a result of that challenge uh, for what is, I think, a novel and, I hope, highly effective procedure for Stage 2. It will allow the maximum participation by members in this chamber to offer their views on proposed amendments to the bill. And it will allow for in-depth scrutiny by an expert committee of individual, of in, uh, of individual amendments that is the feature of normal Stage 2 proceedings. And that committee this morning, the Financial and Constitution Committee, uh, was challenging and detailed in its scrutiny of the bill at this stage. Now, I hope members are satisfied with that approach. I want to pay tribute to the imaginative way that the Bureau, the committees, the government and parliament, let me just finish, government and parliament officials have worked together cooperatively to develop new procedures to meet these unique circumstances. I Jamie Green. Uh, the minister asks uh, that he hopes members are satisfied with that approach. Does the minister think that one evidence session from one witness is absolutely sufficient to uh, duly scrutinise this bill. I'm not satisfied, and I suspect many other members aren't either. Minister. Well, um, I think Mr Green needs to look at what has happened. There has not been one evidence session with one individual. There has, for example, this morning been in the Finance and Constitution Committee a panel which was closely questioned for an hour and a half. I have appeared before. I believe I am appearing at four or five committees next week and others are doing so too. But I would ask the member to consider whose responsibility this is. It is the UK government's responsibility for, for pursuing Brexit. For pursu well, the members may not wish it. Tory, Tory members may have great difficulty in taking responsibility for their Westminster colleagues, but they have that responsibility and they should face up to it. Now, presiding officer, 
let me consider committee scrutiny. I pay tribute to the rapid mobilization of committees of this parliament to examine the bill, to provide the chamber with detailed insights and their perspective. Yesterday I said I gave evidence to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee in an interesting session. I think the convener has now written to the presiding officer with comments and that those comments are available to every member and have been distributed. The government, of course, will be considering carefully our response to the points. But, of course, we also provided the committee yesterday with detailed information on some specific questions that had been asked, and we will continue to do so. And I noticed today, for example, that, uh, you know, could I please make some progress? I also noticed this morning that Spice has issued a note of yesterday's meeting which summarizes the evidence. All, a whole range of things are being done to help the Chamber to consider this bill and to meet the objections raised. I have sessions with the Environment and Climate Change Committee, the Equality and Human Rights Committee, Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee next week, and I shall be returning to the Finance and Constitution Committee. I look forward to all of those sessions. They are signs of the seriousness of intent in this Parliament in considering the continuity bill and that the maximum possible scrutiny within the time frame is being applied. Now, presiding officer, for the remainder of my remarks in opening stage one, I want to concentrate on the purpose of the bill and its major provisions. I'm sure the Chamber is well aware of the Scottish Government's view on leaving the EU. I find it difficult to overstate my own fears about the damage that is being done to the UK and Scotland through this process in almost every aspect of our political, social and economic life, which we did not vote for. But the Scottish Government has always accepted that necessary steps have to be taken to prepare for withdrawal and that the Scottish Government and Parliament has a responsibility to play its full part in those preparations in areas for which we have legislative consequence. Hence, we have engaged with the UK Withdrawal Bill. Hence, we have introduced the Continuity Bill. And as set out in Section 1.1 of the Bill, its purpose is to make provision for ensuring the effective operation of Scots law so far as within devolved legislative competence upon and after UK withdrawal. And it, of course, Neil Findlay. Several, uh, several times the Minister's uh, Cabinet Secretary has been asked to publish the 25 areas of contention. Uh, he has said there is no agreement on that. Previously he published 111 areas uh, where there was going to be discussion. Maybe as a way out of this, would he publish the 86 areas where there has been agreement? <laughs> Minister. I admit it, to be, to be absolutely accurate, and I want to be very accurate in this because the member asked me this question yesterday, I gave him an answer. Mr. Bibby asked me this question this morning, I gave him the same answer. I spoke to, and I put this on the record, I spoke to my Welsh counterpart about a range of issues actually yesterday and today. Um, I raised the, uh, two days ago and today, I have raised the issue of publication and I will raise the issue of publication again tomorrow at the JMCEN and my officials have raised it too. I wish to publish, it is my intention to publish, I hope that tomorrow we will agree to publish. Now that is the answer I've given twice, I put it on the record for the third time and I hope that we will have that list published as soon as we possibly can and certainly I would hope well before stage two. Let me make some progress. As I've said, section 1.1 of the bill makes the provision for ensuring the effective operation of Scots law so far as within devolved legislative competence upon and after UK withdrawal. It achieves that by doing three main things. It saves all domestic devolved law that relates to the EU and separately incorporates devolved EU law that is directly applicable into domestic law. It gives the Scottish ministers the powers needed to ensure that this devolved law continues to operate effectively after the UK has left the EU and it gives Scottish ministers the power to ensure that Scotland's laws keep pace with developments in EU law. The first two of these are familiar to members from the UK Withdrawal Bill. That has been extensively scrutinised by committees of this Parliament. For today, I highlight, will highlight some differences from the approach in that bill. In saving currently applicable EU law, the bill has two main differences from the UK bill's approach. First, it retains for devolved matters the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is not retained by the UK bill. The Scottish Government considers that the Charter is an important source of law and protections, and that certainty and continuity of law and the principles which apply to that law should continue to be the same on and after exit day. Second, the Scottish Government considers that the general principles of EU law should have the same status after exit day as they did before. Again, to achieve certainty and continuity, there should, after withdrawal, be the ability to bring an action based on the general principles of EU law. The UK Withdrawal Bill does not allow such actions. Turning to the powers to fix, yes, of course. Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really seeking your advice and guidance on the issue of scrutiny. I understand that you're seeking a deal with the UK government. What is the standing of this legislation if a deal is achieved? 
and what opportunity is there for this Parliament to scrutinise that deal, given we don't know where the areas of dispute are? Well, I've indicated that I wish to publish further information. And I've just given that commitment for the third time, and I'm happy to give it again. Um, I also gave a commitment to Patrick Harvey last week that if an agreement was likely to be reached, we would come to this chamber uh, and we would ask the chamber for their views on the matter, and particularly in terms of proceeding with this bill, which we do not think we would want to proceed with if we were able to reach an agreement. So that is a commitment I made last week. I repeat it here. Now, let me try and make some progress on this. The bill for devolved matters retains the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which I have said is not retained by the UK bill. We consider the Charter an important source of law and protections. We also consider that the general principles of EU law should have the same status after exit day as they did before. Turning to the powers to fix deficiencies on retained EU law following withdrawal, the government acknowledges the criticism been made of the scope of the equivalent parts of the UK withdrawal bill. However, despite these criticisms, the government shares the view of the uh, Delegated Powers Committee on the UK Bill when it said the committee reluctantly accepts with the unprecedented task of modifying domestic legislation to preserve the statute book on leaving the European Union and the short time frame in which it is to be done necessitates broad powers. In any other circumstances, the conferral of such wide powers would be inconceivable, but the committee accepts that in these circumstances, the taking of wide powers is unavoidable. However, to address some of the criticisms made by the committee, there are, as I have indicated to Mr. Rumbles, important changes made from the UK Bill. Most significantly, the power can only be used when it is necessary to address a deficiency. Once that threshold, which is defined in the Bill, has been reached, it is then for ministers to decide the appropriate fix for the deficiency, but there is a higher initial test for the power to be applicable. There are additional limits built into the powers. For example, they cannot be used to modify the Equality Act 2006 and the Equality Act 2010, as well as the Scotland Act 1998. In addition to the normal negative and affirmative procedures, the bill includes an enhanced version of affirmative procedure where the powers are used to create a new public body, transfer functions to a new public body, or abolish an existing function. The Scottish Parliament is given 60 days rather than 40 days to consider the order. The Scottish Ministers must also consult on the proposals and report on that cons consultation to the Parliament. I will. My this matter is very simple. You are taking powers to yourself for 15 years out of the hands of Parliament. Parliament can only say yes or no. It can't do its job in legislation. That's the point. Minister. It, to the member, the, quote, the, the, the view of the Delegated Powers Committee about the exceptional nature of these circumstances, which are not of our making. I do not wish to leave the EU. I, I think many people in this chamber do not wish to leave the EU, and we'd be happy not to do this. But in the circumstances created, we must have a reasonable response. We have made sure that that response is more uh, scrutinised by this Parliament than the response from the UK Government, and we are open to further discussion, further debate, and further amendment. And I've made that clear. So I look forward to seeing what amendment is brought, and then we can debate that in detail within the confine of the fact that this is a job that has to be done. I don't want to see it done. I'd rather not leave. So would Mr. Rumbles rather not leave. But within the confines of what has to be done, then we have uh, some pressures upon us. So there are uh, two aspects of the powers that I also want to mention. Firstly, the power bill allows ministers to fix deficiencies in directly applicable law in EU devolved areas. Members will be aware that one of the criticisms of the UK bill, it would only allow UK ministers to fix such laws. And secondly, the bill requires UK ministers to seek consent of Scottish ministers if they wish to exercise their powers in the UK bill in devolved areas. Again, this was a point made both by the uh, Delegated Powers Committee and the Finance and Constitution Committees. It also illustrates how this bill, presiding officer, has been drafted to work alongside the UK bill. Our intention remains to work closely with the UK government on the necessary secondary legislation flowing from Brexit, whatever the eventual primary legislative arrangements. This would include consenting to UK-wide orders, touching on devolved matters, where that is the best course of action. Any such proposals would be subject to the scrutiny of this Parliament. The final aspect of the bill I want to touch on is the keeping pace power in Section 13. There are likely to be fields, fields that we want, at least in the short term, to maintain regulatory alignment with EU rules. This will mean choosing to keep pace with developments in a particular field of regulation after UK withdrawal. For example, continuing to apply new and developing rules about food safety, which are updated regularly, without which 
many people, and I'm people in my own constituency, for example, who export live shellfish, would not be able to operate. Now, the government is clear that this approach is part of a coherent continuity of law, and therefore a power properly in the bill. The power is sunsetted after five years with possibility of extension by affirmative order. Given the considerable uncertainty about events, the government considers this is a prudent approach. Discussion of any extension will take place against the backdrop of any longer term arrangements that are then in place, including agreements with the EU for market access and with the knowledge of actual use that has been made of the power over that period. I'm aware of criticism of this provision. I'm happy to discuss possible changes to address this. But I believe this is a crucial power in minimizing disruption from Brexit and providing <coughs> coherent continuity of law over the next few years. Presiding officer, we hear a great deal about regulatory alignment. There needs to be something in the bill that allows that to take place. Now, I said at the start of my remarks, I remain regretful that we still need to carry on with this bill. I should also say I think that that regret is now mingled with some admiration for the way that many members of this parliament have reacted to what are challenging circumstances and continue to do so. They are not of our making, but we need to make the best of them. I am confident the bill will receive extensive scrutiny in the time available, and the government will and should find that a challenging process, and we will face up to it. The first step is taken today, and I therefore invite the parliament to agree to the general principles of the con continuity bill in the motion in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on Bruce Crawford to speak on behalf of the Finance and Constitution Committee. P point of order, Senator Officer. Point I, of I, order, Mr Crawford. I, I don't think I'm actually speaking on behalf of the Financial and Constitution Committee the, in this particular debate. My name was put in as a speaker on behalf of the SNP. Aha. Uh -huh. So for, I, I don't, <laughs> but I don't mind speaking just now. I'll put my lecture. No, in that case, if, if you don't mind, if you're speaking on behalf of the SNP, in that case, if you don't mind, I'll move to the first opposition speaker yeah, and I'll come back that. in that case. Okay. So I call on Adam Tompkins to open for the Conservative Party. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm happy to give Bruce Crawford's speech if we want to swap, but, um, but, 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 but perhaps not. The Scottish Conservatives Presiding Officer will vote against this bill at stage one this evening because this bill is unnecessary, it is seriously flawed, it is ill thought through, and it is incoherent. Errors compounded by the reckless speed with which the government is railroading the bill through Parliament. Even worse, this bill is incompetent. Our very own presiding officer has told us so, yet the SNP carry on regardless. Regardless of the views of the presiding officer, regardless of the rule of law, and regardless of the very devolution settlement, which they claim to champion in their rhetoric, yet trample all over in their actions. Let me start, Presiding Officer, with why this bill is unnecessary. Now, we all agree that there needs to be legislation to give effect to the democratic decision of the British people in June 2016 to leave the European Union. And we all agree that that legislation needs to make provision to correct and update the statute book so that it hangs together and makes sense in a post-Brexit world. We also all agree that that legislation must respect the foundations of the United Kingdom Constitution, including the devolution settlements in Wales, Scotland, and soon to be restored, we hope, in Northern Ireland. Nobody can seriously think that leaving the European Union means that we somehow revert back to the Constitution of 1972, the year the UK joined. Leaving the European Union means, among other things, that this Parliament will get even stronger. Already one of the most powerful devolved legislatures in the world, the Scottish Parliament will inherit a fresh suite of powers when we leave the European Union. Powers, presiding officer, yep. none of which the SNP actually want, despite their yep. mocking. They don't want powers over Scottish agriculture, or environmental protection, yep. or fisheries, or state aid, or public procurement. Yep. No, they want all of these powers to remain in Brussels. Yep. Now, the, the legislation... The, the, le the, legislation, the legislation to do all of this, the legislation to do all of this, to give effect to the referendum result and to correct the statute book so that it makes sense post-Brexit is, of course, the European Union Withdrawal Bill, which, was passed, uh, which has passed the House of Commons and is now in the House of Lords. Now, we all agree, presiding officer, that that bill is flawed and needs to be amended so that it achieves its objectives fully in accordance with our devolution settlement. This parliament has been unanimous on that point, and the UK government has listened and has undertaken to amend the bill. Now, that amendment does not go quite far enough for the SNP, but we learnt at the weekend, presiding officer, that we are now just a single word away from agreement between the governments. Yet now, both the negotiations at government level 
and the all-party consensus in this Parliament have been placed in jeopardy by the SNP's so-called continuity bill. Yep. So-called because the reality, presiding officer, is that it is no such thing. This is not a bill designed to create continuity, but to sow the seeds of confusion, even chaos. It's not a legal continuity bill, it's a legal confusion bill, a wrecking bill. It's a wrecking bill. It threatens to wreck the negotiations, and it certainly wrecks the consensus that has existed in this parliament. Its own policy memorandum says that this bill will, and I quote, add to the complexity of Brexit and will present serious logistical challenges. Not my words, presiding officer, but the Scottish government's words. And they rather give the game away, don't they? This is a government, it seems, that's no longer all that interested in doing a deal with the UK government on the withdrawal bill. The SNP is reverting to the stance it first took about Brexit, the stance that cost the nationalists 40% of their MPs and half a million votes in June's general election, the stance that tries to maximise the complexity and challenges of Brexit in order to sow the seeds of constitutional division. Yep. That the bill is seriously flawed and ill thought through is not just my view, presiding officer. It is the view of a number of expert witnesses who gave evidence this morning to the Finance and Constitution Committee. Professor Alan Page of the University of Dundee said, for example, that he has considerable doubts over whether the bill constitutes an effective solution to the challenge the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament will face in preparing the devolved laws for the UK's withdrawal from the EU. This, he says, is for the simple reason that the bill does not resolve, indeed cannot resolve, the critical question of which EU competences are devolved and which are reserved. This is a question that can be determined only by Westminster legislation, which is why we on these benches say that the right vehicle is the EU withdrawal bill and not this wrecking bill. The Law Society of Scotland is equally critical. The Law Society rightly draws our, our attention to the way the bill introduces wholly new categories of law, like retained devolved EU law, which will make it more difficult, says the Law Society, to be certain about the law. How ironic, then, that, the, that legal certainty is one of the general principles of EU law that the bill seeks to preserve in Scots law in Section 5. The reality is that this is a bill for legal uncertainty, legal confusion, legal chaos, the very opposite of legal certainty. The bill fails to meet the tests set by the very same general principles it seeks to preserve. We are, presiding officer, some way through the looking glass here, Mike Russell in Wonderland. The Law Society is critical of Section 4, which seeks to save rights and obligations derived from EU law in Scots law after exit day, arguing that the bill needs to specify which rights and which obligations are meant. The Law Society is critical of Section 5, which seeks to safeguard the general principles of EU law in Scots law after exit day, arguing that the bill needs to explain which general principles are referred to. Now, I'm not going to give away to Mr Harvey, not after his disgraceful interventions in last week's debates on this issue. Even after that is done, even after that is done, the Law Society warns that inconsistencies between Section 5 and the Withdrawal Bill might create complications. Well, on this, the Law Society is rather, po rather politely pulling its punches because we know that this provision has been designed by the SNB to go out of its way to create complications. The Law Society is similarly critical of Section 6 on the principle of supremacy and of Section 10 on the interpretation of retained devolved EU law, pointing out that this last section, rather embarrassingly for the government, fails to reflect what was agreed between UK and EU negotiators last December as regards the ongoing jurisdiction of the Court of Justice on matters pertaining to citizens' rights. There's going to be a lot for the Finance Committee to amend on Tuesday, presiding officer, assuming that this bill passes stage one tonight, which of course it shouldn't. I said at the beginning of my speech that this bill is unnecessary, seriously flawed, and ill thought through, and also incoherent. And I've dealt with the first three of those charges. Let me turn now to the charge of incoherence, which I think is the most serious one. The Lord Advocate was asked a number of questions last week about what will happen if this bill is passed by this Parliament, but thereafter found by the Supreme Court to have been passed incompetently. He declined to answer such questions because he said they were speculative. But when considering the general principles of legislation, as we are this afternoon, it is wise, presiding officer, to consider their likely effects and their possible consequences. So here's one scenario. Suppose that there is no agreement on Clause 11 of the Withdrawal Bill and that this Parliament presses ahead with Stages 2 and 3 of this Bill. 
Now, the Scottish ministers have said that it should follow that the devolution provisions of the withdrawal bill would then be removed from it. Now, I think that is highly unlikely for the very reason which the Lord Advocate would not concede last week. This bill, if passed, is much more likely than not to be challenged in the Supreme Court. I think we all know that. And if it is struck down, and if the devolution provisions of the withdrawal bill have been removed, there would then be no lawful means whatever of correcting the Scottish statute book so that it makes sense post-Brexit. No sensible UK government could allow that risk to be run. Yes. Um, yes, sir. This, this could, of course, um, be theoretically possible, though I indicated to the member this morning I thought it was highly unlikely. But the member in his questioning this morning indicated that the UK government would be likely to ignore the Sewell Convention in these circumstances. So is he saying that the Sewell Convention is about to be suspended by the UK government, which would be a very considerable and difficult step to take? Adam Jenkins. Absolutely not, because the Sewell Convention was suspended by Mike Russell last week, and I'm going to quote to him exactly the provision of his speech last week that suspended the Sewell Convention because he... He do, he's, he's not quite as clever as he thinks he is, and he doesn't quite know what he's doing. What of Sewell? What of Sewell, I hear you cry. The UK... The UK... The UK would have to remove the devolution provisions from the withdrawal bill if we did not consent to them, wouldn't it? Well, no, presiding officer, because this parliament, contrary to the advice of the Scottish Conservatives, decided last week to fast-track this bill. Now, emergency legislation is the very opposite of normal. And, as has many times been pointed out, the Sewell Convention applies normally. It does not apply in exceptional or abnormal circumstances. In moving the motion last week that the bill be fast-tracked, the Minister, Mr Russell, said this, and I quote, This is a novel situation. In normal times, such a bill would follow a normal timetable, but these are not normal times." Unquote. There we have it, presiding officer, the minister's own admission, repeated three times in a single sentence, that Sewell no longer applies, meaning that the UK Parliament is now free to legislate on EU withdrawal even if we do not give our consent to the withdrawal bill. Not my words, but the Minister's words. So, Presiding Officer, I'm in my last 30 seconds. I'm in my last 30 seconds. So, Presiding Officer, far from, far from safeguarding the interests of this Parliament, this bill and the way it is to be enacted in haste have completely undercut and indeed betrayed the interests of this Parliament. The SNP are playing games with the Constitution, yeah. Presiding Officer, but they don't even understand the rules. Until the introduction of this bill, we in this Parliament had more leverage than many observers may have realised. For the House of Lords would, I think, have found it very difficult to give the withdrawal bill a third reading had we declined to consent to it. But that leverage has now been traded away. We are not in normal times. Sewell doesn't apply. Our voice is diminished and the hand of the UK Government is vastly strengthened. All thanks to the SNP. Great negotiating. Well done. <laughs> And I call on, call on Neil Findlay. I wish, uh, I wish we were not here debating this bill. I wish the Scottish Secretary, David Mundell, and Ruth Davidson, the Tory leader, uh, had fulfilled their commitments they gave to this Parliament, to the UK Parliament and the people that we represent. I wish the Tories hadn't made such a mess of the process of devolving powers to this Parliament. But they've failed miserably. And instead of recognise this, recognising this and doing something about it, they're digging an even greater hole for themselves. In the House of Commons, Labour's Shadow Scotland Secretary, Leslie Laird, moved an amendment that would have removed the EWB's proposed restrictions on the ability of the Scottish Parliament, the National Assembly for Wales, and the Northern Ireland Assembly to legislate on devolved matters, and it would have created, a new, it created new collaborative procedures for the creation of UK-wide frameworks for e retained EU law. But every compliant and subservient Scottish Tory MP was whipped to troop through the lobbies to trample all over the devolution settlement. And in that debate, Mundell said, I know she, Leslie Laird, doesn't like it, but the bill is going to be amended. It's going to be amended not at the behest of 
the incoherent approach put forward by the Labour opposition, clearly a distinct lack of self-awareness there. It's going to be amended because the Scottish Conservatives have come forward with practical amendments to the bill. And Ruth Davidson and Mr Tompkins told us it would all be resolved in the Commons and then it would all be fixed in the Lords. What happened to these amendments? Where are they? Did they appear during the parliamentary process? No, they did not. And by the 10th of January, just a month later, the full extent of the Tory shambles was exposed. No amendments, no agreement in devolved powers, no dispute resolution process, nothing except a constitutional standoff playing straight into the hands of the nationalists. Can I ask Mr Tompkins, who instructed Tory MPs to vote the way they did? Was it the Prime Minister? Was it Ruth Davidson? Or was it Mr Mundell? I will give way to him if he's willing to tell us uh, and tell the public what role his leader in Scotland played. Did she issue instructions or did she just follow instructions? President officer, not even Mary Berry could deliver a bigger custard pie to Ruth Davidson than the Tory party in this one. If the Tories had supported, the Tories had supported Labour's amendment, there would have been full transparency over areas of disagreement in a disputes resolution process. And not a word of apology from the great professor, Mr. Tompkins. Wasn't it telling, wasn't it telling that the man who lectures people in constitutional law couldn't even take an intervention from teeny weeny little Patrick? There he is, exposed, exposed for what he is. As it stands today, yeah. Mr. only Findlay. the cabinet Mr. secretary. Mr. Findlay, Mr. Findlay, just a second. I'm conscious that uh, passions are running quite high this afternoon, but a couple of members have already strayed into rather personal terms. Just please keep the proceedings as formal as proper, as is correct. As it stands today, only the Cabinet Secretary and his counterparts in the UK and Welsh governments know what the issues are. The rest of us are in the dark about what we're being asked to vote on. Asked last week uh, for the issues of contention to be published, I put down a parliamentary question, asked in the Delegated Powers uh, Committee and I've asked again today. Uh, it's unacceptable that we cannot see what is causing this standoff. But, President Officer, we have to go back to the history of devolution to get to the heart of why Scottish Labour Party gives their cautious support to the principles of this bill. But I must stress that uh, support is not unconditional and we will seek to amend the bill. There's no blank check for the government on this. We have very serious concerns about timetabling, about the rush nature of the bill, about the time limited for consultation, the rights of people we represent to shape its content and the powers it seeks to place in the hands of ministers. We have concerns about the way that this is being handled and, and about the government's selective use of challenge to the rulings of the presiding officer. Members will recall the trade union bill in the last parliament when the Labour Party challenged the presiding officer's ruling on whether this parliament had legislative competence over areas of that Tory bill. What happened then? Did the Scottish Government bring in the Lord Advocate to support the position they held and we held? No. Their members cheered to the echo when my friend James Kelly here was excluded from the Chamber for challenging that decision. The hypocrisy and double standards are there for all to see. But going back to the recent history of devolution, older members will recall that when the Constitutional Convention was formed, it was Labour, the STUC, the Liberal Democrats, the Green Party, the Communist Party and the churches who all came together to work cooperatively, cooperatively, do the heavy lifting with long debates and compromise all round to, to, deliver the, to deliver the blueprint for a new parliament. You will notice from that list two significant omissions, no Tory party and no Scottish National Party, both of whom were completely hostile to devolution. So when we hear David Mundell and Ruth Davidson, Nicola Sturgeon and Mike Russell claim to be the defenders of the devolution settlement, let us take this with a gritter full of salt. The SX, SNP exists to end devolution. It wants to use Brexit as another means of creating division between Scotland and the rest of the UK to advance its overall policy objective. Contrast that with the Welsh Labour government who have introduced a continuity bill because they want devolution to work and so do we. So, President Officer, we will support this bill. We want those powers coming from Brussels that would ordinarily be devolved to be exercised by this parliament and we will move amendments to the bill on a range of issues. 
despite our reservations about the bill and the whole process, we have a duty to try and make this bill as good as it can possibly be. Finally, presiding officer, I say to Ruth Davidson and Mike Russell, get your people back round the table, get this sorted. Let us get back to discussing the issues that the people we represent see as a priority. Their jobs, the economy, their living standards, the health and social care self service, and their child's education, and how we build a future for all our people. Thank you. I call on Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I agreed with some of what Neil Finlay had to say, and I'm big enough to say so. Um, <laughs> even, if, uh, even if occasionally his, his judgment let him down. And I, I'm, I'm certainly uh, happy not to repeat any disgraceful slurs uh, on, uh, on other members of other places uh, who think that an issue, for example, as, as uh, complex as the Irish border is no more complicated than the uh, London congestion charge. But I, I, I do note that uh, Mr. Tompkins, Professor Tompkins, uh, questioned the intelligence of a member of uh, this chamber, unimpeded, presiding officer, uh, and I wonder if he would reflect on that. The discussion at Finance and Constitution Committee uh, today covered several aspects. It covered issues around competence, uh, issues around necessity, and issues around the content of this bill. I would like to address my remarks mostly to the content and to the changes that I think we need to make to this bill to improve it. But briefly on competence. There is clearly, uh, as we've been told, room for disagreement uh, on the interpretation of the questions relating to competence. These are judgment calls, not definitive rulings. But it does seem to me, with the greatest respect, presiding officer, uh, that the view that the bill is not competent does not appear to be gaining ground when we look at the range of other views being expressed. And I don't believe that we can take that as a reason not to take action. I don't think we can take that as a reason not to take action because the bill is necessary. Should we do nothing and leave ourselves with a legal cliff edge? Of course not. No one would say so. Should we trust the UK government to its word, a word which has been broken repeatedly throughout this process? I'm afraid they have failed too many times already for us simply to trust that they will reach an acceptable agreement in the time available. Should we introduce this bill and then have the minister continue to negotiate with the UK or introduce this bill and then legislate? Neither of these is perfect. But to leave ourselves without the option of passing this bill would simply be to hand a victory to those within the UK cabinet that Mr. Thompson, uh, Mr. Tompkins had no hostile words for, no harsh words, those who are fundamentally opposed to devolution and to the respect for the right of the people of Scotland to govern themselves on matters which are already devolved within our devolved powers model. Yes, indeed. John Lamond. Thank you. I mean, I'm sure you must share, uh, Patrick Harvey must share my concern that this Parliament may be used as a bargaining chip in a, a negotiation that's happening elsewhere. Can I ask his views on whether this bill should continue, regardless of whether a deal is done or not? Or what role does he think this Parliament ha would have in scrutinising any deal should one be secured? Patrick Harvey. My own view is that the uh, gap between where the UK government currently is and what would be acceptable, certainly to me, uh, is so significant that I find it banishingly unlikely that the UK ge government will give sufficient ground for a, an agreement which is acceptable. However, after we pass this bill at stage one tonight, as I hope we do, it will be for this whole parliament to decide whether we consent to the bill's withdrawal uh, in those circumstances. Uh, I'm afraid I, I do need to, to move on. One of the reasons why legislation in this parliament is a preferable route from my point of view, is that it gives us the opportunity to move beyond arguments about what the UK Parliament ought to do with its legislation and actually make changes to legislation here to improve it. And I will uh, advance arguments on that based on the broad principle that power should sit with the majority in Parliament, not necessarily with a minority government. Both governments in this situation are minority governments. Neither has a mandate for unilateral action. Uh, and I believe that if it's very brief, Mr. Rumbles. Mr. Mike Rumbles. Is Patrick Harvey satisfied 
with Section 13, which takes powers away from this Parliament for a period of 15 years, gives it entirely ministers and takes the decision-making away from us. Patrick Harvey. I'm not going to say that I'm satisfied with the detail of any section until I've seen everyone's amendments, including those that Mr Rumbles uh, brings forward. I'd like to make some, some progress on the specific changes that I think are necessary. The, the Minister talks about the range of scrutiny measures which will be available for subordinate legislation, the negative, the positive and the super affirmative procedure or the uh, enhanced affirmative procedure. I think there is a case not only to have some definition about that in the bill, but also for Parliament to be in a position to decide for itself that uh, a measure currently uh, requiring negative procedure should get positive uh, procedure, or indeed that consultation should be necessary and the enhanced procedure should be used. I think that decision should be available for Parliament to make through some form of sifting mechanism, whether through an, ind an independent committee or through our subject committees. In relation to section 17, which again the minister referred to, the ability for Scottish ministers to consent to measures taken by UK ministers on devolved matters. This clearly must require parliamentary consent, not merely ministerial consent. Now the government has given us some verbal reassurance that parliamentary consent will always be needed. I believe there is a case for putting that on the face of the bill so that ministers are not in the position ever of being able to agree to consent to UK measures on devolved matters without the agreement of this parliament. And finally, presiding officer, on urgent cases, uh, the opportunity for ministers uh, to effectively pass laws, change laws, and then ask parliament's approval afterwards is a massive new power. And again, uh, I think we need to improve the parliamentary scrutiny uh, on that, either by means of an emergency break or a time limit between the making of a, uh, an instrument uh, and the laying of it, uh, or indeed measures to prevent that from happening during a parliamentary recess. Finally, presiding officer, uh, I don't have time to go into detail on the submission by Scottish Environment Link, highlighting the gaps which will still exist in the place of environmental EU principles in domestic law. The actionability of those uh, will be better than under the UK legislation, but does need to be spelled out more clearly, as well as measures to close what Link described as the environmental governance gap. I will hopefully advance arguments for changes to the bill which will address all of these matters, and I absolutely give an assurance to others that we will take an open mind to any other amendments uh, from whichever political party which seek to improve and strengthen parliamentary scrutiny of the powers that are created under this bill. Thank you very much. And I call Tavish Scott to open for the Liberal Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we will vote for the bill at stage one because the Scottish Parliament is uh, where we are. We want the governments of the nations of the United Kingdom to agree on the powers that should be here in Edinburgh, in Cardiff, in Belfast and indeed in London. And it is disappointing that the Conservative speech this afternoon did not start from that basis, start from the need for an agreement. Indeed, the briefings to the press this week suggest that is, more, is further away than it uh, is closer. Um, indeed, Adam Tompkins' speech was a speech masquerading as a parliamentary assessment of the bill rather than what it really was, which was a political justification for the Tory position. A position which is not about the future of the nations of the United Kingdom, but about unity in the Tory party. Uh, I hope the uh, minister's meeting tomorrow, I hope the minister's meeting tomorrow, uh, Ruth Davidson laughs, well if someone should know about, the, uh, know about unity in her party, I suppose it's Ruth uh, uh, Davidson and she's obviously working very, very hard to, if, if Ruth Davidson wants to stand up and say what her position is, she can go right ahead. Ruth he Davidson. Wants to talk about party unity, can he just remind us how his enormous group of five voted on the recent budget? Yeah. Liberal Democrat, uh, sorry. Is that, is that it? Is that it? Is that it? I'll tell you what we did. We voted for our constituents, and you should do the same on Europe. <coughs> and if, uh, if the Tories started putting their constituents first on Europe, we wouldn't be in this place that we are here uh, today. 
No, uh, like, like Neil Finney, I, I share uh, some of his concerns over the, over the bill uh, itself, and we will, uh, as I'm sure the government would expect, bring forward some amendments in a number of uh, areas, uh, because the one aspect of Adam Tompkins' speech I could uh, take today uh, is the concerns over the parliamentary scrutiny and the concerns over the manner in which this parliament will uh, keep a check on what any government of any political persuasion will do uh, in the future. And that does, to a large extent, concentrate on Section 13 uh, of this uh, bill, because this is a truncated uh, approach, given the, both the complexity of the bill and the little time that we have, not to necessarily consider it, but to reflect on any of evidence that any of the parliamentary committees uh, receive. So our, our concerns are around that, that section in uh, particular, because it does uh, give uh, sweeping powers to any ministers. It may not be Mr. Russell in 15 years' time. Indeed, there may be few in here who'd be sitting on the front bench at that time. But to have a power that potentially uh, leaves ministers uh, for the next 15 years without the necessity of, of bringing back to Parliament, can I just finish this point, and then I'll happily give way, necessity to come back to Parliament on the actual power that it is, uh, I do not think is a measure that we should consider uh, Indeed. Happy to give way. Michael Russell. I, I just want to make it clear that the proposal is five years with renewal available after scrutiny. And of course, I indicated in my, 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 my opening speech that that would include, of course, a consideration of how the power had been used. But I will return to this when we have a debate about it because there are strong reasons for having some continuity. That has been su su supported by members of the Liberal Democrat Party in, in the UK Parliament because of the need for regulatory alignment. Right, let me uh, offer a couple of reasons in addition to that one as to why I would suggest to Mr. Russell there's a better way to handle it. And if he is, and I'm sure he is, true to the point he made in his opening remarks about accepting uh, a different way to approach this issue, I hope he might accept a couple of points. Firstly, uh, what he's encouraging Parliament to do in terms of Section 13 is to accept EU regulations post-March of next year, 90, uh, 2019, uh, without uh, having any influence on what they are at all. Now, he and I do not want to be in that position but that is the position that we would be in and that cannot be a good way uh, to proceed. Uh, secondly, the, uh, we would wish uh, to make sure those changes are compatible with uh, Europe. Well, if that is the case, then the way to do that is to introduce legislation in this place on these matters, yeah. is to make sure that this Parliament, uh, through one of the portfolio ministers on the front bench, introduces the measures that they judge to be appropriate to keep pace with what is happening uh, in Europe. Now, I think in, to, to defeat that line of argument, Mr. Russell and his colleagues uh, we need to do more than just say there are stakeholders who, say, who have concerns, which is what, is, what uh, the uh, letter from the, the uh, committee says to Parliament uh, today. They need to set out the range of those uh, concerns, the range of those stakeholders, and the range of legislation that we would be brought forward. We're all aware of how, much, how many statutory instruments come from, or, or uh, instruments, I should say, come from Brussels every year to the uh, UK Parliament and thus to the devolved parliaments of the United Kingdom. But nevertheless, uh, to go with the power that's in section 13 uh, without uh, considering what that actually means in practice I don't think is is uh, realistic and appropriate and the final uh, suggestion I want to make to, to the minister is this that that uh, we cannot have that power in isolation uh, he has made much and rightly made much of the need to uh, collaborate and come to agreement with Cardiff and with and indeed he's doing it on this bill because it is the same bill as in or at least we are, we are told it's the same bill as in Cardiff with Belfast when those when the, uh, the government of Belfast is back in place and indeed with London. In other words, the administrations around the United Kingdom need to agree. Well, here, this power has no mention whatsoever of the other administrations of the United Kingdom. And if we are to maintain a single market, including on things like animal health, in which she has made an argument, and there is a real logic, believe me, as a rural member, I certainly take this from my constituency, a real logic to having animal health regulations which are consistent across the UK for those of us who had to deal with BSE and the, and the aftermath of all that, then there should be something in Section 13, if it is to be uh, to in any way appropriate, that there should be agreement uh, and discussion with the other administrations of the United Kingdom uh, to achieve exactly that. So that's why I want to just finish with the letter that the devolved powers, uh, delegated powers rather, committee uh, wrote uh, to the minister um, earlier, and uh, in, in which it, se it uh, sets out what, what happened uh, in respect of this particular aspect of the bill. Um, the minister, uh, in the letter, it says that the minister 
explained that this power uh, has been included in the bill in response to concerns raised by stakeholders. I just simply ask in, in the way in which Neil Finlay is looking to, for clarification uh, on the powers, uh, I simply ask that the government set out uh, who they are and make sure that committees can properly look into that. And that the Minister has been surprised that a similar power has not been included in the European Union withdrawal bill. Well, that doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right to have it in London just and, uh, for the very reasons that we've been looking at. So I would like to propose to the Minister that when he's considering a better way to achieve uh, what he wants to achieve in Section 13, the best way of the lot would be ensure that uh, this place deals with primary legislation uh, on the very measures that we would all seek to and need to address, but does it in a way which allows the full and proper parliamentary scrutiny. Thank you. We come down to the open part of the debate. And before I call Bruce Crawford, I'm going to call Graeme Simpson to open on behalf of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, I am speaking uh, as a convener. Um, like the EU withdrawal bill, this bill confers wide powers on ministers and consequently is of great interest to my committee. The tight timetable for considering this bill has imposed significant restrictions on the ability of the committee to apply thorough scrutiny to this bill and as convener I find that unacceptable but we all take our jobs seriously and my fellow committee members my impressive deputy convener Stuart McMillan Alison Harris David Torrance and the ever entertaining Neil Finlay will do it as thoroughly as the limited time allows the committee took evidence on the delegated powers in the bill from the minister uh, yesterday at its uh, meeting uh, we sought to answer the questions that we always seek to answer on all bills. Is it appropriate to confer these powers on the Scottish ministers? Are the powers appropriately framed? Do the powers match the policy intention as expressed in the Delegated Powers Memorandum? And are the powers subject to an appropriate level of parliamentary scrutiny? Now, having taken that evidence, the committee agreed to draw a number of the powers to the attention of the Parliament and wrote to you, presiding officer, this morning. Normally, we'd do a detailed report, as we did with the UK bill, and that's what should be happening here. I'm not going to cover all the powers mentioned in that letter, but I want to highlight some of them. In some of the cases, it is to welcome how the Scottish Government has responded to concerns the committee had about similar powers in the EU withdrawal bill. In other cases, it is to note the Government's intention to bring forward amendments to respond to concerns raised by the committee. There's a remaining category of significant powers which I want to draw to the Parliament's attention. Firstly, section 11 of the bill confers a wide power on the Scottish ministers to correct failures of retained EU law, to operate effectively, and also to correct deficiencies in retained devolved EU law. The committee has already considered evidence in connection with similar powers in the European Union withdrawal bill. In its report on that bill, the committee concluded that, quotes, the powers should only be available where ministers can show that it's necessary to make a change to the statute book, even if they cannot show that the particular alternative chosen is itself necessary. The committee therefore welcomes that this bill has restricted ministers' powers to making changes that are necessary rather than appropriate. Section 13, 1, is described as a power to make provision corresponding to EU law after exit day. The government's delegated powers memorandum describes the power as giving, quote, Scottish ministers the ability to ensure that where appropriate, devolved law in Scotland keeps pace with post-withdrawal developments in EU law. Now that's a very significant power and would potentially allow delegated powers to be used for a wide range of circumstances that may otherwise be considered appropriate to be done by primary legislation. The committee queried whether this power was appropriate to the purposes of this particular bill. We also queried whether there was the same urgent need for such a power and therefore whether it was appropriate to include such a power within a bill being treated as an emergency bill. The minister said this power had been included in the bill in response to concerns raised by stakeholders and that he'd been surprised that a similar power had not been included in the European Union 
Withdrawal Bill. He explained that this power was needed for practical reasons to ensure that, where appropriate, certain areas of law could keep pace with EU law. The Minister suggested that environmental law and food safety law were areas in which there may be a desire to use this power to keep pace with EU law. In his view, this power was appropriate for inclusion. The committee has not taken a definitive view on this. The bill allows the Scottish ministers to set an exit day by regulations. The power does not provide any limits on the date that can be fixed. I ask the minister why the bill does not just say that exit day is the day the e UK leaves the EU, since that is the factual situation. He said the power would not be used to set a different exit day, but pledged to amend the bill in response to that point, and that is to be welcomed. Finally, in addition to exploring the delegated powers in the bill, the committee also asked the minister and his officials for a legal explanation as to why the bill had to be subject to the emergency procedure. The minister committed to providing that explanation. Uh, the committee has not had the opportunity to consider that response yet. We will follow the progress of the bill over the next two weeks, but we should have had longer. Thank you. I now call on Bruce Crawford to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Uh, thank you, President Officer. President Officer, this debate today is a very important occasion, perhaps more important than most. This occasion is also somewhat unique, is it not? It's a debate in which the vast majority of MSPs, if not all, strongly wish was not taking place at all. Certainly from a personal perspective, I'm deeply dismayed that it's proved necessary for the Scottish Government to introduce this emergency bill. However, I've reached a clear personal view. In my mind, it is without doubt a necessity for this bill to be before us today for debate. Quite simply, it is necessary for this Parliament to be in a position, if all else fails, to be able to protect the powers invested in it following the successful devolution referendum in 1997 and the Scotland Act of 1998. An act so cleverly constructed and delivered by Donald Dewar that enabled the creation of the first Scottish Parliament in over 300 years. So this debate today is about so much more than just a debate about the potential impact of Clause 11 of the EU Withdrawal Bill or the Continuity Bill. And I recall so well the sheer joy of the opening day in July 1999 and the beginning of a new democracy in Scotland. This debate today, almost 19 years later, is about defending that very democracy that so many fought so long and so hard to create. This debate today is about protecting that precious democracy that Donald Dewar and well as many others allowed to come to flower in 1999. And today, let us recall clearly the only party represented at Holyrood who campaigned against the creation of this institution was indeed the Tory party. That was a, there were, of course, Conservatives who supported it. There were notable exceptions. Nonetheless, the establishment of the Conservative Party were bitterly opposed. And at this time, I'm far from convinced that today's UK Tory party are in re reality much changed in tone and attitude towards this parliament, as was the case in the past. I sincerely hope I will be proved wrong regarding my scepticism and that agreement will be reached and this bill will become an historical irrelevance. I certainly previously hoped that agreement would be reached and arrived at and the Secretary of State for Scotland would be in a position to deliver on his promise to sort Clause 11, albeit on a timescale much later than originally envisaged. But this hope was all but dashed by the tone and attitude adopted by, recently by the Cabinet Office Minister, David Liddington. We can only assume he is closer to the leadership of the UK Tory government than the rather forlorn figure of the Secretary of State for Scotland, who appears to have promised more than he can deliver. And here I've got to say I disagree with Neil Finlay. When he, when, he, when he characterised the Tory government position as a custard pie. I think it's much more an eaten mess on this occasion. <laughs> and, and I'll give that line to Ash Denham, so it's not so many laughed as I thought there would be. <laughs> in, the, in the near future, though, we'll know the answer as to whether agreement can be found. But I, for one, am not prepared to take a chance on agreement being found. There are no guarantees, and I'll take some convincing that any promises 
for the future are deliverable. That is why the background of this continuity bill is so important, and that's why I'll be voting for its general principles at decision time. Now, I know today the majority of Tories here at Holyrood are supporters of devolution. They clearly demonstrated that by supporting the Finance and Constitution Committee's position in declaring Clause 11 incompatible with the devolution settlement. But I ask the same Tories today, that if you're not prepared to support the passing of this bill in principle at decision time, and if agreement cannot be reached, will you vote with those who would protect this Parliament and vote to refuse consent to the EU withdrawal bill? Because your decision day may be coming very soon. Will you side? Indeed. Jeremy Balfour. We all want to protect this Parliament. What is your view that if the Supreme Court, in due course, do say that this bill is illegal and cannot go ahead, what, how does that protect the Parliament? That, that's already been addressed, Mike Russell, but I'll, I'll say this to Jeremy Offer. Um, I've got to ask you and the rest of your colleagues, whose side will be on? Will you be protecting democracy in Scotland and this Parliament of Scotland, or will you be taking the Tory party line from London? That's going to be the question that's coming your way very shortly. So, in closing, President Officer, let me outline my position in regard to the issue of competency. First, let me say I don't disrespect the position adopted by the presiding officer in regard to competency. But let me put it simply. I choose to agree with the position of the Lord Advocate, Scotland's top law officer. And I use that word choose deliberately because this is a matter of who we are as parliamentarians and who we choose to believe. As Patrick Harvey said earlier, we heard this morning, we heard this morning at the Finance and Constitution Committee, there is space for disagreement in this matter. It's therefore not as simple as the matter of who is right or who is wrong in terms of the finer point of law. And in this view, in this view, I am reminded of the words of Donald Dewar from the opening of this parliament and the birth of a new democracy on the 1st of July 1999, when he said on that fantastic day, this is about more than our politics and our laws. This is about who we are and how we carry ourselves. So when we come to decision time, let us all remember these words. This is about who we are and how we carry ourselves. Support the general principles of the bill. Vote to protect this parliament. Vote to protect this democracy in Scotland. We owe it to the memory of those who fought so long and hard to bring this parliament into existence, to protect the powers of this parliament. So do the right thing. Christine McKelvey to be followed by Jackson Carlow. Christine McKelvey. Thank you uh, very much, Presiding Officer. It's my belief that for the UK to leave the European Union is the greatest act of political self-harm of our time. We have not yet properly seen the damage unfold, but when it comes, it will be, I believe, immense. And the purpose of the bill before us today is abundantly clear. It will be a vital declaration of protection for every individual in Scotland, preserving and defending our devolution and our very democracy. It will mitigate the impact of Brexit on this parliament and on the Scottish government and on Scottish society. Though sadly, it cannot save Scotland completely. Okay. John Lamond. Can I assume from what the member has said that regardless of whether there's a deal or not, you think the bill should continue? Christina Mulcahy. I think um, the bill is in place today in order to ensure we get that deal. And if we don't get that deal, we have to protect this place. But I also have to say that David Mundell gives me no reassurance that we will get a deal. David Liddington gives me no reassurance that we will get a deal. So in order to protect this parliament's power and this parliament's place in our nation, we need this bill today. So let's make no mistake about that. The very ethos, the reconvening of this Scottish parliament in 1999 is now under threat. One that would have horrified Donald Dewar. And Theresa May doesn't seem to know from one day to the next whether it, it, she's actually trying to put in place. She has no idea 
She's riddled with contradictions. She wants a hard Brexit, but she doesn't want a hard border in Ireland. Well, I'm sorry, those two are mutually exclusive positions. She can't have a UK imperialistic cake and still eat from the EU cake. She needs to recognise that there are 27 other countries within a clear and long-established entity that want to protect their own interests rather than indulge the UK's. And while she continues her lament for British imperialism, we need to make sure we understand what she might do next. Not a mean feat. And if the Scots won't do what they're told, that's the message we were getting last week, then she wants to, the ability to pull back her devolution and tell us we've all been bad children and put us on the naughty step, maybe forever. But just because she can't decide what to do about anything and totally rejects any concept that might just irritate her Brexit fanatics like Jacob Rees-Mogg, Boris Johnson or even the DUP doesn't mean she won't act at all. Only that she will almost certainly make the wrong decisions. And in some sense, she is a hostage as much as Scotland is. Her own position is dictated to her by others. She is the proverbial puppet on a string. And Brexit is not just about economics and trade. I am fed up hearing about that. It is also about the profound impacts upon all of our rights. Indeed, leaving the EU will deprive us of the benefits that have been guaranteed by, to us by the EU through its Charter of Fundamental Rights, which came into effect in December 2009. This charter guarantees a far wider range of rights than the UK's 1998 Human Rights Act. It prohibits, for example, all discrimination based on sex, race, colour, ethnic origin, religion, disability, age or sexual and gender orientation. It also guarantees access to health care and those very, very valuable environmental protections that we all need. Presiding officer, I'm profoundly concerned that people who voted Brexit didn't realise they were voting to limit, even lose altogether our rights at work, such as their reasonable working hours and holiday leave, rights under the European Courts of Justice, rights in pregnancy and maternity leave, and a host of other protections that seem set for the bonfire of EU legislation that will follow Brexit. For example, Vernon Bogdan, our Professor of Government at King's College and author of Brexit and our Unprotected Constitution says, and I quote, Last autumn, two employees sued foreign embassies for unfair dismissal, failure to pay the minimum wage and holiday pay and breaches of the working time regulations. One embassy claimed immunity under the State Immunity Act, but the Supreme Court overruled them. Rights that we can lose. Opportunities to access that additional power of justice will vanish on Brexit Day, and this is something that makes me both angry and alarmed. Brexit will reduce our rights and protections given by the European courts. People will lose their automatic EU right to healthcare anywhere else in Europe on the same terms as local population. A broken leg in Benidorm is going to be a very, very expensive business. The Conservative notion that there is no threat is utter fantasy. Since their own leader seems to have no idea what or how to guarantee those rights, human, consumer, children's, employment, equality, disability, just for some would be lost post-Brexit. And I'm not inclined to assume the outcome will be in line with our current deal. As John Major remarked last week, presiding officer, there can be no Brexit outcome that will be good as the package we already have from within the EU. I hear nothing that gives me any reassurance, only a lot of anxiety and ever-increasing sense of doom. But I'll tell you, presiding officer, who does give me reassurance? Our Lord Advocate and his detailed, considered and thought-out determination. He gives me reassurance. And as my colleague Mike Russell highlighted last week, we may not ultimately need the bill at all, but he has equally made it clear that it needs to be in place and in place fast to avoid the danger of the whole Westminster rickety, unguided train passing a bill, then it's too late for us to do anything to protect our own position in this parliament. That would leave any Westminster government to suddenly decide to repeal the entire devolution package. We could literally see a Scotland spun back under Westminster rule, silenced. Presiding officer, I believe that's unthinkable. We must have this bill, and I urge my college to support the general principles of the bill at five o'clock today. Colin Jackson Carlisle to be followed by Alec Neil. Jackson Carlisle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. C can I start with a word in defence of the reputation of Mary Berry? 
Uh, because were she to bake it, it would be a custard tart and not a custard pie, Mr. Finlay. <laughs> and can I say to you that she currently has a series in BBC One, Mary Berry's classic recipes for people who find cooking challenging. Uh, you'd do well to watch it. I only hope she could have a series on Brexit for you to watch too. <laughs> Presiding officer, I remain an optimist. Maybe a little later. I mean, I, 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 not much you can tell me about baking, I fear. Um, <laughs> I, I remain an optimist. Um, my colleague Adam Tompkins and I will look at the same glass of water. He will see it half empty. I will probably see it half full. Uh, neither of us is right nor wrong. Uh, but I therefore want to be slightly more generous and to say that I continue to believe that it is the endeavour of ministers to actually secure an agreement which will render this bill unnecessary. Why do I want to continue to believe that? Because both the Deputy First Minister and Mr Russell have told me that that is the case. Uh, and that is why I think the, the, most prefer the preferable option is that that agreement is struck and that this bill does not proceed. And I think it's worth just you know, going back to September when Mr Russell came to the chamber and, and sought the support of all of us uh, to look at the bill that had been published and to accept, as we subsequently all did, and as Mr Crawford recognised, that Clause 11 was unacceptable, that there was a unanimous consent across this Parliament that that was so and that an amendment to that would be needed. And we have also in this chamber joined in the frustration of others that that amendment has not yet been achieved, that for whatever reason, changes of ministers or whatever, uh, those discussions have not yet led to a conclusion. But nor would it be fair, I think, as the some in this debate have already characterised, and as some might like to do so, that there has been absolutely no progress whatsoever in these negotiations. These negotiations have actually led to significant progress between two governments. We remain obstructed on a key point which the First Minister herself identified in this chamber last week as essentially revolving around a key fundamental and hugely important clause a particular word whether this parliament gives its consent or whether it is consulted on the frameworks uh, and disagreements within the frameworks that might arise and I'd like to come back to that but I do hope that in the discussions that take place this week and ahead of or at the very latest on March the 14th when the Prime Minister and the First Minister are hopefully scheduled to meet that the nature of an agreement building on the work that both governments have done can be found in the resolution of the debate that remains over that fundamental clause so that this bill need not proceed. Now, while I believe that's the objective of ministers, I have to say I don't necessarily believe it's the objective of the whole chamber. I do think in his naked, unvarnished prejudice against Westminster, expressed again by Mr. Harvey today, there is a desire among some not to see agreement, but actually to see the confusion, legal confusion bill, as Mr. Tompkins called it, as the preferred option, perhaps in a minute, as the preferred option. I don't think Mr. Harvey is alone. I think there are some within the SNP who feel that way. I think even on the front bench, Rosanna Cunningham, through her sort of exhortations and also, the, you know, the, her expostulations and her body language during these debates has also given the impression she would prefer no agreement was reached and that this bill was the preferred route forward for the Scottish Government. Mr. Swinney. Deputy First Minister. I'm, great, I'm, I'm grateful to Mr. Carlow for giving me. Can I take him back slightly in his speech to where he gets accurately to the problem that is in this negotiation? And the resolution of that point has to be considered as to whether or not it can be resolved in a fashion that either protects devolution or undermines devolution. And that is what this government is concerned to advance. But equally, would Mr. Carlow accept that the United Kingdom government must also determine the issue on that same question. I want, to come very Jackson I want to come very specifically to that point. We know that there are 111 powers, and I don't think it's unreasonable to say that these are powers which the SNP in principle would prefer never again cross the channel to these aisles and were left permanently in the hands of Brussels and not in the hands of this parliament or Scotland, Scottish government ministers. But we know that these 111 powers have been narrowed down to a series of powers which would require to be covered by framework agreements. The word consent or consultation, I understand the anxiety of the Scottish Government about the word consultation, but I hope they can also understand the anxiety of others about the word consent, because consent implies veto. And not just one veto, but three. The veto of Wales, the veto of Northern Ireland, the veto of Scotland. 
And the Westminster government, charged with the sovereign responsibility of protecting the single market across the United Kingdom, on which so much depends, cannot agree to an arrangement whereby any one of four parties could exercise a veto yep. over something as fundamental as the internal working of the single market across the United Kingdom. And so it cannot and it will not agree to the word consent. So I want to be clear with Scottish Government Ministers. There are urgent talks taking place this week and in the run-up to the meeting on the 14th of March. But it has to be understood that the word they are seeking is as equally unacceptable as the word the, as the word the UK government have used to date is to them. Therefore, all sides have to approach these final discussions with the greatest possible imagination and resolve to arrive at an agreement. Yeah. Deputy Mr. First Minister. Very briefly. I, I'm, I'm grateful to Mr Carlaw again. But doesn't Mr Carlaw have to acknowledge that the constitutional structure of the United Kingdom is fundamentally different because of what the UK has legislated for with devolution. And his argument that essentially there is fun finally no role for the Scottish Government to exercise proper devolved competence where that competence has been legislated for in successive Scotland Acts, yeah. that we have a right yeah. to protect that. Jackson Carlow. What I have said is that I think the agreement that has to be reached over the next few days has to be one which both governments engage in and understand that there are wider issues. Simply to arrive at a point where any one of four governments could paralyse the internal market within the United Kingdom by refusing to give consent to something as fundamental as animal welfare rights across the kingdom is not something that the Westminster government can or will accept. My concern fundamentally as we stand here today is that this bill is adding confusion. It is consuming the narrative that needs to take place if this agreement is going to be reached. I believe that those discussions should be the primary focus of all ministers in Scotland and at Westminster over the next 10 days. It's urgent that this issue is resolved, or as Adam Tonkin says, the devolution settlement which we all want to see protected will be undermined inadvertently by actions which I think could be far-reaching in their consequences to this parliament. Thank you. I call Alec Neil to be followed by Claire Baker. Mr Neil, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by agreeing with uh, Jackson Carlow on two fundamental principles? And I think the, everybody in the, my party agrees with these principles as well. Principle number one is that getting an agreement would be the best solution for everybody between the Scottish Government and the UK Government. And I was under the impression as a backbencher that that's the direction that everybody was trying to head in. And the second point is that we all agree that the, whatever those arrangements are, they should not pose any threat to the integrity of the UK single market. And can I say that doesn't just apply in a devolved settlement. If and when Scotland becomes an independent country, I would argue that we would need arrangements between an independent parliament in Edinburgh and the Westminster Parliament to protect the integrity of the UK single market. So it's in the interest of everybody on this side of the argument, as well as in the interest of everybody in that side of the argument, to try to get agreement. The problem is, and this is what my worry is, until last weekend, I thought that everybody was striving for the same objective that Mr. Carlo wants and that we want, to reach an agreement and to do so within the next few days because time is beginning to run out. My worry was when I saw a briefing, not in one newspaper, not in two newspapers, but clearly a fairly wide briefing from Downing Street that the Tory UK government was now intent on, quote, freezing the powers of the Scottish Parliament and that meant not devolving the outstanding 25 powers. Now, that, clear, that briefing clearly was given fairly universally, and it must have been given by people who are not sharing the same objective as Jackson Carlaw and me, because that briefing certainly does not help the situation one iota. Now, during his speech, Jackson Carlaw suggested that there may have been a change of ministers presumably primarily the loss of Damien Green, who I think got this, uh, with the replacement of David Livingston, who, to, to be fair, has no experience in these matters in its ministerial background. But my worry, particularly with that briefing, 
is that it's not just a change of ministers. What that briefing suggested on Sunday was there's a change of policy by the UK government. And they're digging in their heels and deciding that we're not going to get these 25 powers. And that's where I come on to the speech by Adam Tompkins. Because Adam Tompkins referred to contradictions and incoherence. But if I may say to Adam Tompkins, where I think there's incoherence in his position is that, and he pointed this out in his speech, the Scottish Tory group, the Scottish Tory party, signed up to the unanimous decision taken in this parliament that we wanted all 111 powers that were currently in Brussels devolved to the Scottish Parliament where they belong after Brexit. And I think we had, you know, thought we had unanimous agreement on those points. I, however, it would appear we do not have unanimous agreement on those points. And what this is about is these outstanding 25 powers. This bill has nothing to do with whether you voted for or in favour of Brexit or not. It's about the implications of Brexit for this Parliament's powers. Now, my view, I will in a minute, Joanne, my, my view is very clear, and that is that there is a way forward if everybody is prepared to be reasonable and there is no change of policy, which there appears there might be in London. And that is for us to agree basically on two things. One is that the outstanding 25 powers, like the other 86 powers, be repatriated to this parliament from, if you like, from whence they came in terms of the law on devolution. They are devolved powers. Those powers belong to this parliament. They should come back to this parliament. But in return, because we do need to give reassurance, and this is where I think Jackson Carlaw has got it wrong in terms of the word consent, meaning veto. I don't think that's what the minister intended, and I don't think that's a correct interpretation. I think basically, and I'm sure the minister will clear that up in his speech, but I think clearly there has to be a bit of a quid pro quo. There has to be some kind of dispute resolution procedure, whereby if there is a belief that a particular measure by a devolved government or a Westminster government is going to adversely affect the UK single market's integrity, there has to be a procedure, uh, which eventually, if we, agreement can't be reached politically, is resolved by a dis an agreed dispute resolution procedure. And for the life of me, I do not know why this poses such a major problem to the UK government. We go right back, I'm unfortunately old enough to remember the original devolution bills that were presented by the Wilson and Callaghan governments. In there, there was a proposal, because there was no tax raising powers, for a joint exchequer board. Indeed, in the fiscal framework signed by Mr. Swinney last year, or two years ago, we have a fiscal committee, a joint a fiscal committee. And the purpose of that is to iron out differences without having to go to the Supreme Court as the final arbiter. And it seems to me, if there's still genuine intention in the UK government to reach agreement, and I know there is in our party and our government, I'm absolutely convinced of that. I know Mr. Tompkins thinks otherwise, but I'm absolutely convinced about that. Then all reasonable people could come together and reach an agreement that we can all sign up to. And that, at the end of the day, is what the Scottish people want. With your permission, I'll take Miss Lamont's, or my I'm, not I'm afraid your permission. not. I, okay. I, I, I think Miss Lamont's down to, uh, are you down to speak, Miss Lamont? Well, I, I'd let her do it, I think. I'd like to hear what she has to say. Okay. If you do, thank you. Miss Lamont. I was so mesmerised by your contribution. I wondered whether, um, while you say that there's come and go in this question, are you concerned by the suggestion by some that this bill, the purpose of this bill is to protect Scotland from Brexit, from which I read is, is actually um, more than simply a bargaining chip in order to encourage the UK government to come back to the table? My view is Briefly, very simple. Mr Neil. My, my view is very simple. The purpose of the bill is to protect a devolved settlement, full stop. 
That's what the purpose of the bill is. Nothing to do with Brexit or otherwise per se. It's about protecting the devolved settlement. And I believe if the kind of solution I've outlined is implemented, we'll do exactly that. Thank you. I call Claire Baker to be followed by Tom Arthur. Ms Baker, please. Um, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, it's fair to say that this is unlike any stage one I have participated in during my time in Parliament. Usually we have a few weeks in committee hearing important evidence, a chance to question the Minister and the time to consider a detailed report which is then recommended to Parliament. With this bill we have not had time to pause or to catch breath. This does lead to legitimate concerns over effective scrutiny. No one wants the Parliament to be passing poor legislation which can lead to more problems than solutions and then often have unintended consequences which can cause future difficulty. I do appreciate that there have been efforts to address some of these concerns. A number of committees, including my own, are taking evidence on the bill this week and next week. I understand that the official report will be concentrating on the evidence sessions at committee to ensure they are available to all members as soon as possible. It has also been helpful to consider the evidence previously taken by the Finance and Constitution Committee into the UK Government's EU withdrawal bill. Um, I welcome the Minister's commitment to provide briefings, but so far they are largely a summary of information we already know. I hope we have more substance going forward. And while we have the policy memorandum, the Government does need to be more transparent about where the points of contention with the UK Government are. I recognise that the Minister wants agreement from other partners on this, but I believe that MSPs would benefit from knowing more about where the disagreement lies. The assurances from the UK Government are unconvincing, but we need to know more detail about the disputes. I am most grateful to the Law Society for their briefing in advance of the debate. They identify a number of areas where greater clarity is required. The bill before us does mirror the EU withdrawal bill, but as the Law Society identifies, it does then replicate many of the issues which affect the EU withdrawal bill. The Law Society described this bill as sharing the challenges of being complex, often difficult to interpret and sometimes lacking clarity. We should take the opportunity to alter the bill and look at ways where we could improve it. The report from the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee today echoes some of the issues highlighted by the Law Reform Society. Section 13.1 is described by the Law Society as a significant power to implement powers in Scotland corresponding to the EU, even if the EU law is effective after exit day. The committee have questioned whether it is not more appropriate for this to be done through primary legislation. I note that the Minister has today said that it is appropriate for this power to be in the bill, but I anticipate this is an area that will be returned to at stage two. There are serious concerns that parliamentary scrutiny would be lacking in areas where it is necessary. In highlighting section 10 on the interpretation of retained devolved EU law, the Law Society identify one of the challenges of this whole situation when they argue that the section 10 does not currently reflect what was agreed in the 2017 joint agreement in December. The Brexit process is so fluid, but it is important that the legislation is accurate and perhaps the Minister could comment on these points in closing. It should not be necessary to have this continuity bill before us but the task we have today is to agree the general principles. Does it, does it achieve what it sets out to do? It aims to provide continuity for EU law, which is currently devolved, sorry, which is currently operating in devolved areas, give ministers powers to ensure devolved law continues to operate effectively, but grants powers to enable devolved laws to keep pace with EU law after exit. It is one stop on the Brexit journey. But we shouldn't forget that even accepting this principle was a small victory, giving a degree of continuity and recognising the strong ties that are with our legal, social and environmental laws. So these measures, whether they are through this bill or achieved through the UK bill, are essential and need to be supported. But this bill before us is as much about context as content, and the consequences for pursuing this bill are much wider than this legislation. This is probably the first time the Parliament has considered a bill which, while there is a great deal of disagreement, there is also agreement that it would be better if this bill were to become redundant. The next few weeks are crucial if an agreement is to be reached. One of my first roles as Deputy Convener of the Culture, Europe, Tourism and External Affairs Committee was to meet with representatives from the House of Lords Committee, along with Welsh Committee colleagues, to share our serious concerns over Clause 11 and its implications for the devolution settlement. 
It is clear that the EU withdrawal bill as it stands is not compatible with devolution, does not respect the devolution settlement and could not command the support of the devolved parliaments. But the intransigency of the UK Government has led us to this position. There was an acceptance that there needed to be changes to this bill, but they haven't been forthcoming. The Conservatives are incoherent on this issue. Reaching stage one today cannot have been a surprise. This issue has been unresolved for months. The lack of action from the Conservative Government brought Labour to bring forward amendments at Westminster to introduce a presumption of devolution, a principle which is widely accepted. In not accepting Labour's amendments, the UK Government said it would bring forward its own amendments to protect the devolution settlement. But they have delayed, prevaricated and come up short, meaning that no deal has been reached but time is now running out. So I urge the UK Government and the Scottish Government to work as hard as they can to reach an agreement. In closing, President Officer, the Law Society argue there is a public interest in the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament publishing the legal advice they have received on the legislative competence. These are exceptional circumstances. The Parliament is prepared to advance with a bill which does not have the confidence of the presiding officer. It is a matter to be taken seriously and it's one that I believe justifies the sharing of legal advice. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Tom Arthur to be followed by Maurice Gould and Mr Arthur, please. Presiding officer, this year marks the 20th anniversary of the passing of the Scotland Act 1998, an act that gave effect to the overwhelming wishes of the Scottish people as expressed in the devolution referendum of the preceding year. As such, it carries with it a weight and political legitimacy, perhaps more normally associated with a written constitution. While devolution has been and remains a process, the existence of this Scottish Parliament is the settled will of the Scottish people. For my own and subsequent generations, and I say this as the first member to speak in this debate who was not old enough to vote in the devolution referendum, this Parliament has been and remains a permanent fixture of adult life. It is the centre of Scottish civic and political life. And indeed, this is a view held by a majority of people in Scotland as reflected in surveys of public opinion. Consequently, any proposed changes to the competencies of this Parliament are of a fundamentally different category to any other matters that come before us in this place for consideration. Presiding officer, as things currently stand, the UK Government's European Union Withdrawal Bill presents a challenge to the powers and legitimacy of this Parliament, unprecedented in the 19 years since it was reconvened. That the powers of this Parliament are under threat is not in dispute. The Finance and Constitution Committee of this Parliament reported with unanimity that, that, that the proposals contained within Clause 11 of the European Union Withdrawal Bill, as introduced by the UK Government, are, and I quote, incompatible with the devolution settlement in Scotland and fail to fully respect the devolution settlement. Presiding officer, it remains the case that the best way to remove this threat to Scotland's devolution settlement is for Clause 11 to be amended to the satisfaction of this Parliament and legislative consent to be subsequently granted for the EU withdrawal bill. This represents the most efficient and elegant solution to the current constitutional impasse. However, this can only be achieved if the UK government grasps that this debate fundamentally concerns a matter of principle, namely that decisions regarding powers devolved to this parliament must remain with this parliament. If we can make a bit more progress, please. An agreement should be achievable. However, the actions of the UK government since June 2016 do not give cause for optimism. Meetings of the GMC have often been irregular. Assurances of a joint approach ahead of Article 50 were shown to be hollow, with the UK government's position presented to the devolved governments as a fait accompli. And amendments proposed by the Scottish and Welsh governments, which could have allowed legislative consent, were dismissed by the UK government. From this long, dismal sequence of repeated rebuffs, it is clear that the UK government does not view the UK as a partnership of equals, as Theresa May once described the relationship between the UK and devolved governments. And rather than Scotland being invited to lead the UK, the UK government now seeks to impair this parliament's ability to lead Scotland. Presiding officer, while time does remain for an agreement between the Scottish and UK governments to be reached, we are now running out of track as the EU withdrawal bill will shortly be entering its concluding stages at Westminster. Therefore, it is incumbent upon the Scottish Government and this Parliament to make preparations for all eventualities. The introduction 
of the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill represents a correct and proportionate contingency measure should agreement not be reached. It is correct in that it will enable legal continuity post-Brexit and safeguard the powers of this Parliament. It is proportionate in that it contains a mechanism for its own repeal should agreement on Clause 11 be reached between the Scottish and UK governments. On the issue of the timing of the introduction of the continuity bill, had it been introduced prematurely, the Scottish Government would no doubt have been criticised with perhaps some justification for attempting to prejudge the outcome of negotiations with the UK Government. However, the bill has been introduced as late as reasonably possible when account is taking of both the four-week lying period prior to royal assent that the bill would face if enacted and the earliest date that the European Union withdrawal bill could be passed at Westminster. Presiding officer, this being a stage one debate, we are of course being invited only to approve the general principles of the continuity bill. However, I do wish to say that I recognise the legitimate concerns of members regarding scrutiny. I therefore welcome the work of both the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and the Finance and Constitution Committee, which is already underway. And I further welcome the role, the formal role for the Finance and Constitution Committee at stage two. This is of course not ideal. However, nothing in the entire Brexit process can be described as ideal. Absolutely. Presiding officer, this is a bill I would rather we were not required to consider. I voted Remain along with the majority of my Renfrewshire South constituents and the overwhelming majority of the Scottish people. Being stripped of our European Union, European Union citizenship against our will is an offence to democracy in Scotland. To be faced with a UK government seeking to unilaterally strip powers from this parliament is intolerable. Presiding officer, the Finance and Constitution Committee was clear. Clause 11 represents a fundamental shift in the structure of devolution. It is incompatible with and fails to fully respect the devolution settlement and the committee is not in a position to recommend legislative consent on the withdrawal bill. The fundamental issues that led to the committee reaching these conclusions have not, as of yet, been resolved. If ultimately we must withhold legisl legislative consent, then we will require our own legislation to safeguard this parliament's powers and to ensure the stability and continuity of our laws after Brexit. It is on that basis and with regret that we find ourselves in this situation, that I support the general principles of the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. Thank you, Mr Arthur. I call Maurice Golden to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Mr Golden, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In 1997, the people of Scotland voted to establish a new Scottish Parliament. Like Tom Arthur, I was not old enough to vote in that referendum, but I have the utmost respect for the institution that it created. A parliament, I'd like to make some pro progress, Mr. Findlay, thank you. Uh, a parliament that we have the honour of serving in, a parliament that should ensure that Scotland prospers, a parliament that respects the law which created it, and a parliament which acts in accordance with both customary and codified legal practice. What we have before us today, presiding officer, is a bill which fails in every respect. It is out with the competence of this parliament. It is poorly constructed. It won't be properly scrutinized. It risks Scotland's prosperity, and it is a salacious attempt to launch a second independence referendum campaign. Mike Russell. Minister. To two ago that the government had breached the law with this bill. Could he, could he explain that more fully? Because the law as it stands and the practice of this parliament is that the government is quite entitled to bring this bill in um, if the, even if there is no statement from signing officer. What law has been breached? And if it has not been a law, perhaps he will withdraw that allegation as it would be untrue. Maurice Golden. Uh, the bill is out with the competence and if you read the official report you will see that I did not make those remarks as you suggest. But what this is, is bad law, badly constructed, which will end badly for Scotland. Now, if the SNP are prepared to ride roughshod over the presiding officer and the devolution settlement in this case, then what's, them, what's to stop them doing it again? Just last year, Nicola Sturgeon tried to force through another independence referendum against the will of Scots. It was only when the Scottish electorate 
sent a clear message to the SNP at the general election that she was forced to take a pause on a new independence referendum. When will this pause be over? The truth is that the SNP is using wildcat legislation on Brexit as a dry run for forcing an emergency second independence referendum bill. I'd like to make some progress. As a result, this is not a serious bill please, of law please sit down, Minister. from a sober-minded government. It is a Scottish National Party pamphlet masquerading as legislation. It is a classic piece of SNP theatre. Take an issue, stir up grievance and force a confrontation with the UK government. Scotland, along with the rest of the UK, is leaving the I'd EU. I'd like to, please sit down, Mr. Arthur. Please, uh, Mr. Corrie, just a minute. Mr. Golden, just a minute. I'd like to hear what the member has to say, please, even if you disagree with it, that's dem democracy. Please proceed, Mr. Golden. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scotland, along with the rest of the UK, is leaving the EU and we must be prepared. There is a mechanism already in place to make sure we are, the UK government's EU withdrawal bill. There are challenges to overcome. These have been recognised um, before this parliament can grant its consent. But progress has and is being made when the British and Scottish governments sit down, talk and tackle the issues head on. That is the way we ensure Scotland and the rest of the UK benefits from Brexit. That is the way in which we ensure this Parliament secures new powers. And that is the way in which we ensure the interests of the Scottish people are served. A barrel load of powers will be devolved to Scotland. And this is something I welcome. Claire Hawhey. Ms Hawkey. I thank the member for taking the intervention. I would like to know if the member could list the new powers that are coming to this parliament. Maurice Golden. Aviation noise and 85 other powers that will be coming and we could publish them if your government hadn't decided to block it. So there is a barrel load coming and in fact compared against each other the UK government is committed to giving more powers to this parliament than the SNP government. Yep. The SNP government the are hell-bent on answering to their European masters, the Brussels bureaucrats, who want to give all of Scotland powers away. We are presented, we are presented with a continuity bill, but it offers no continuity, only chaos. We are told it must be treated as emergency legislation. But no matter how much they claim it to be true, there is no emergency. It will be over a year before the UK leaves the EU. And yet the SNP would have us believe that we must steamroll this bill through Parliament in a matter of weeks. I'm in my last minute. Why the rush? There is only one reasonable answer to this question, to avoid scrutiny. And whenever a government tries to avoid scrutiny, it cannot be said that they are acting in the public interest. What do they have to hide? Again, there is only one reasonable answer to that question. They want to hide the fact that they don't want negotiations with the UK government to be successful. Let me end on a more positive point. Cool heads <laughs> must prevail. And there is no time for putting party before country with constitutional <laughs> games. An avenue open to the SNP I'd to like secure to hear, a good uh, deal for Scotland. Calm, calm down, calm down. I'd like, to hear, I'd like to hear the concluding words of the speaker, please. Even if you don't, I will. Please, you've, have you concluded? Not quite yet, presiding One officer. more sentence, Mr One Golden. One more sentence. An avenue open to the it opened to the SNP to secure a good deal for Scotland, but this bill puts it at risk. And I say to the SNP, get round the table with the UK ministers, discuss, debate and do a deal. That is what Scotland needs and that is what you must deliver. Thank you. I call Stuart McMillan, followed by Rachel Hamilton, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. I'm going to try and take us back into the real world now after that contribution. Yeah. Presiding officer, I reluctantly welcome this bill. 
and I will be voting for its progress at 5 p.m. this evening. And I'll explain why I use the term reluctantly. Presenting officer, this parliament is in a situation not of its own making. If the UK government were acting like petulant children, then an agreement to safeguard the powers of this parliament would be reached. But the power grab is well and truly underway. Our constituents need to realise that this bill before us in the Scottish Parliament uh, need to realise that this, what the Scottish Government are trying to do is actually deal with the crisis being wrought upon this Parliament and Scotland by the Westminster elite marching to the beat of that DUP drum yet again and also the 60 plus Tory MPs with a vision of hard Brexit. It's clear that the UK is in crisis. It's been mismanaged and the lack of detail and vision about the UK when out of the EU offered thus far by the Prime Minister shows the contempt that she actually has for the entire UK-wide population. And when the House of Lords, when this unelected House of Lords becomes the voice of reason within Westminster with the Lords Constitution Committee warning in January that while the legislation, that's the EU withdrawal bill from, from the UK government, is necessary to ensure legal continuity after Brexit, it has fundamental flaws in its current state then it's obvious that the UK is up a creek and a piece of scrap wood, never mind a paddle and a boat. This is why this, is why this Scottish Government con continuity bill is necessary. It's to try and bring about some stability to the Scottish economy post-Brexit. And this chamber has heard often enough about the need for stability and planning and a wide variety of issues. We've heard it year after year after year from opposition parties. And the, but the business community want that to help their planning pre and post Brexit. Now that is the common sense approach. It was also the approach members of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee heard just over a month ago when we went to uh, Dublin and we met up with, met, with representatives <coughs> from the British <coughs> Irish Chamber of Commerce. Now the business community in Ireland are looking at what is required to assist their economy. They are planning as best they can to deal with the fallout from Brexit. And the UK on the other hand is dithering overall but are attempting a power grab at the expense of this Parliament and of Scotland. Now, our influential, our influential Finance and Constitution Committee published a unanimous report uh, that highlighting that Clause 11 in the UK Government Bill is incompatible, and I'm quoting, is incompatible with the devolution settlement in Scotland. That's paragraph 39. And then in paragraph 40, it acknowledges that a continuity bill with a reduced timetable for parliamentary scrutiny is highly likely. Now, this report was published on the 9th of January. The work to produce this report was undertaken in 2017. Therefore, it should not have come as, any, as a surprise to anyone, let alone any, any member of this parliament, that the continuity bill was coming if the UK government continued to consign Scotland as a second-class citizen. And paragraph 36 of the same report welcomes progress that had, been taken, that had, had taken place and also, and I'll quote, notes a recent statement by the Secretary of State for Scotland that the UK Government intends to table amendments to Clause 11. Now these amendments are not here, they weren't in the Commons and thus far they are not in the Lords. So Mr, Mr Tomkins and his contribution earlier on trying to defend his colleagues down in London, which is a shame because when I was at a meeting with Mr Tomkins in London only a month ago, he was defending this Parliament and defending Scotland. The fact that the UK government have reneged on this position will not come as a surprise to some, but clearly will be, an, will be embarrassing for others in this chamber. However, if the UK government, even at this late stage, bring forward amendments to their bill, which are agreeable to the Scottish government, then this Scottish continuity bill can be removed, as Scottish ministers have previously indicated. And if the bill has already been passed, then section 37 of this continuity bill will be enacted. This was once again clearly highlighted yesterday by Mr Russell when he was giving evidence to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. However, <laughs> Mr Russell's evidence was certainly very helpful yesterday, I thought, and the evidence provided Mr Russell and his letter to the DPLR Committee last night, following up some other points raised in the committee, were certainly very useful, and it showed, once again, the level of engagement this Scottish Government are putting into this emergency process. Now, there are some who feel that the emergency process is unnecessary and they're entitled to their view. However, as the Minister indicated again in his letter to the UK Government, e withdrawal bill is scheduled to pass in May so that secondary legislation can start to be made and laid in Westminster. And I quote, making full use of the period before the UK is due to leave the EU. It's therefore a common sense approach for the Scottish Government to actually work in tandem to ensure that this Parliament is not left behind. And I'm quite sure that 
there would be that wall of noise from opposition members if the Scottish Government didn't act in Scotland's interests in this matter. <coughs> Therefore, it's absolutely necessary for this bill to be brought forward as emergency legislation. And secondly, as it's a point I touched upon earlier, this bill should not have been a surprise to anyone. The Finance and Constitution Committee highlighted the possibility of the bill coming, and I believe that the Scottish Government have shown a huge amount of patience towards the UK Government, and I've given them ample time to get their act together to amend the EU withdrawal bill. And the fact that the Welsh Government uh, are also introducing a continuity bill shows that this isn't just a Scotland versus Westminster issue. It highlights the arrogance that the UK Government are actually treating the, both Scotland and Wales within this unequal UK. Presenting officer, uh, to conclude, uh, as a result of the, the differing legal statements, both from the Lord Advocate and the presiding officer himself, this clearly has opened up a line of questioning for, uh, from all those with an interest in the bill. Professors McHarg, Dr. McHarg. I'm Dr. afraid Dr. you must conclude, Mr. McMillan, now. Okay, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. I'm going to be the same with everyone now. Rachel Hamilton, followed by Fulton McGregor, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Ironically, the best advice in emergency is never to panic. Well, the SNP have reversed that and allowed their panic to invent an emergency. We should be absolutely clear. This is not an emergency. This is the SNP deliberately trying to rush and railroad and create a crisis where there is none. It is the result... I will, but just can I just make a little bit of progress? It is the result of a muddled SNP government. First, it's battling with the reality that the United Kingdom has voted to leave the European Union. The SNP will cry that Scotland didn't vote to leave. Well, neither did I. But here I am accepting the democratic decision. I'll take the intervention. Ash Denham. And really, it's a combination of some of the comments I've heard from these benches um, so far today. I'm very much enjoying their attempt to characterise um, this continuity bill is solely an SNP construction. Can the member explain then why the Welsh Government, which is obviously a Labour administration, are doing exactly the same thing? Rachel Hamilton. Well, it's absolutely clear that um, we all want the devolved powers to come back to the, uh, the Parliament, like the Welsh Government do too. The Welsh Government have a different uh, devolution settlement to us, um, so their situation is, is different. So we cannot compare apples and pears. It seems that the SNP have a funny attitude to democracy. They have spent months claiming that devolution itself is under threat, months claiming every insult and injury. This is nonsense. It has been the SNP's insistence they want to deal with the UK government, and it is the UK government who have cooperated by making movement in those negotiations. And I do wish Mike Russell, the minister, every... A good wish. I send him every good wish for the JMC plenary um, tomorrow, and I hope that the negotiations genuinely do go well. But, you know, after all this gnashing of teeth, all that energy spent in deep negotiations, to now introduce emergency legislation, it just beggars belief. And that makes every SNP claim ring utterly hollow. SNP members will take any chance to say Holyrood is being treated with contempt. What could be more disrespectful than rushing through emergency legislation and ignoring the pres presiding officer's ruling by ignoring the rules which define and defend our dem democratic process? The SNP can never again claim any credibility on protecting devolution. Once again, we have an SNP government that will force through legislation to get what it wants. And what this SNP government wants more than anything else is independence, a second independence referendum. And for once, the SNP must drop this ideological obsession and work together like they say they want to with the UK government to get the best out of Brexit. Because until this bill came before us, we were agreed. We were agreed that respecting the devolution settlement created over 20 years ago and protecting the integrated UK internal market was crucial. My colleagues and the SNP were even making progress on this front. This parliament was united in its focus to deliver the best for Brexit for Scotland. We had what people want, constructive working between Scotland's two governments. Mike Russell concluded that a withdrawal bill is necessary. He said, our laws must be prepared for the day the UK leaves the EU. I will, from Christina McKelvey. Christina McKelvey. Uh, Rachel Hamilton said that, um, you know, people, the, the governments were working together and they were doing what people want. I know my constituents wanted to remain. So what does she mean by that? Rachel Hamilton. 
The vote wasn't about Scotland leaving the EU. The vote was about the UK leaving the EU. The bill, however, shows a retraction in the sentiment to work together, a step back from that constructive process. And we should be clear, that was a choice by the SNP. And that choice has the potential to undo all we've been working together towards, respecting the devolution settlements, protecting the inter integrated UK internal market on which our pros prosperity hangs. This bill, as presented, threatens both of those key objectives. I was pleased to hear the words from Jackson Carlow and Alec Neil committing to achieving common objectives. But take, for example, food labelling. We've got to protect the needs of Scottish food producers. We must work with the UK government and other devolved powers to ensure their markets are not affected by divergence. And this may require a common framework. And at the same time, it may be superfluous because this bill cannot work before Brexit, as James Wolfe himself told this Scottish Parliament. And I quote, the bill does nothing that will alter EU law or undermine the scheme of EU law while the UK remains a member of the EU. Rushed legislation, as we all know, take the land reform bill, will not get the best Brexit for Scotland. Rushed legislation in which this SNP government is famous for never achieves what it sets out to do nor rushed legislation allows this P Scottish Parliament to fully scrutinise the bill, as has been mentioned many times today, making a mockery of what we are elected and responsible to do here. This emergency bill is a means to bypass parliamentary scrutiny and simply make the Scottish Parliament a rubber stamping process for what the SNP demands, no matter how unnecessary or damaging it may be. Deputy Presiding Officer, the reason this bill cannot be delivered are simple. It is unnecessary. It is rushed. It damages Parliament, belittles our role as parliamentarians. And as a result of the SNP's desire for const constitutional chaos, leaving the EU in 2019 means the power won't come to the UK or Scottish Government before that time, cements the fact that the SNP's true intention behind the bill is to damage the Brexit process, undermine the Scottish Parliament and further their mission to break up Britain. Thank you. I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Neil Bibby. Mr McGregor, please. Officer, as usual with the Tories, it's all talk and no action. Almost every Tory in this Parliament promised to stand up for Scotland and the interests of the people they claim to serve. But when the time came for action, they voted against proceeding with this legislation that ensures our Parliament isn't stripped of the powers when the day comes for the UK to leave the EU. I, like the vast majority of members in this Parliament and, and at the UK level as well, campaign for Remain, and as others have said, I maintain my opinion that it would be better for Scotland to continue as a full member of the European Union. However, I also accept that until the people of Scotland are given another opportunity to vote for independence, there is little I or anyone else can do to overturn the decision of the people of England to leave the EU. But it is incumbent on all of us as elected representatives to fight for the best possible outcome for our constituents and ripping Scotland out of the single market and the customs union would be a disaster. And that's not my opinion. It's what the leaked Brexit analysis for the Prime Minister said. It's important to note as well that the Finance and Constitution Committee recently unanimously agreed that the Brexit Bill in its current forum is unacceptable to this Parliament and that legislative consent should be withheld, branding it incompatible with the devolution settlement in Scotland. Specifically, the UK Government has identified policy areas where the restriction would have effect in Scotland, such as, but not limited to, environmental regulation, fracking licensing, land use, and public sector procurement. And it is good to hear that the Welsh Parliament has taken a similar view to ours and are calling for a similar bill to be sped through their assembly to prevent a crisis the next day. And regardless to what Rachel Hamilton says, it is a similar situation. As it currently stands, the EU withdrawal bill would give UK ministers wide powers to make legislation in devolved areas and make devolved ministers secondary powers narrower in scope than the UK ministers and subject to constraints such as requiring UK government consent that would not apply to UK ministers' powers. Additionally, the bill outlines that Westminster would no longer be required to legislate consistently with EU law, but the devolved legislators would. The amendments put forward by the Scottish Government in response, devolved ministers' powers to be brought into line with the UK, that devolution statutes be protected from amendment by secondary legislation under the bill, and are for UK ministers to seek devolved ministers' consent before using secondary legislation powers in devolved areas. The government has made it clear that the continuity bill is a backup plan, and like Alex Neil, I, I believe that to be 100%, and its preference is to support Westminster's Brexit bill once an agreement can be reached to drop the restri restriction on competence under Clause 11. 
Furthermore, the Scottish Government has repeatedly indicated that it is possible to establish UK-wide frameworks through cooperation and not when imposed upon by the UK Government with no respect for the devolution settlement. Therefore, it would be an abdication of responsibility of everybody in this chamber to sit back and hope that the Prime Minister and the Scottish Secretary will be willing or able to make the necessary changes to allow this Parliament to reasonably grant consent. The Tories opposed the introduction of this bill while simultaneously agreeing that the Parliament could not possibly grant legislative consent to the Brexit bill as it currently stands. Their contradictory stance would have Scotland in a crisis situation when the time comes to leave the EU, with hundreds of laws relating to agriculture, fisheries, environmental protection suddenly disappearing. It's time for Ruth Davidson to show the leadership that she claims she has and get our Scottish Tory MSPs and MPs to do what it says in the tin, stand up for Scotland. EU agricultural policy covers market regulation, rural development, food law, animal health and quality policy for agricultural products. Without the passage of this continuity bill, withdrawal would create a, more, a major legislative and policy gap in these areas, leaving many aspects of the agricultural industry in a flux. For example, payments are currently made to Scottish businesses under the CAPS programme of voluntary coupled support to help beef and sheep farmers maintain the social and environmental benefits that their livestock bring. If the Tories have their way, we'd be leaving these farmers with no domestic support post-Brexit. Therefore, the Scottish Parliament needs the, ju the jurisdiction to continue reviewing legislation specific to the interests of Scotland. And this bill ensures that, as far as possible, EU laws currently in place will continue to be enforced the day we leave the EU, providing our industries with the stability and protection. It will also require UK ministers to seek devolved consent from Scottish ministers before making devolved legislation, preventing the obvious power grab from Westminster. Furthermore, this bill provides a keeping pace power to allow Scotland's laws to continue and, where appropriate, align themselves with EU law after withdrawal and gives the Scottish Government an enhanced role in scrutinising proposals for changes to laws as a result of withdrawal. It's important to note that despite the emergency treatment of this bill, which is highly justified considering the urgency of passing it before the withdrawal bill is passed, despite that, the bill is still being intensely scrutinised and the Brexit Minister has offered to provide evidence at the committees in the coming weeks, as he said earlier. And finally, our fundamental rights as citizens are currently protected by EU law and it consequently at risk due to Brexit. I think it's particularly telling that Westminster chose not to include the Charter of Fundamental Rights in the Brexit Bill, letting us know exactly what EU withdrawal will mean for rights and equality in the UK. So while the Tories may be fine disregarding the rights of their constituents, the rest of this Parliament is committed to enshrine protections like those in domestic law prior to exit from the EU. So I urge the Chamber to agree the general principles of this Bill and to the Tory MSPs, I ask you, go against your whip and stand up for those who you were elected to represent. Thank you. I call uh, Neil Bibby to be followed by Kate Forbes. Mr Bibby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As others have said, this debate is one which the Scottish Parliament should never be having. Despite any differences about the UK leaving the EU, there has been a consensus across all parties here about the role and status of this Parliament and a common determination to protect this Parliament and its powers. But as Neil Finlay has said, the handling of the European Union withdrawal bill by the UK Government has been nothing short of a disgrace. It is a shambles. The fact that even the Scottish Conservatives have argued for changes in the bill is testament to how bad the process has been up until now. But what is at stake here is not injured pride or bruised egos. What is at stake is the right of this Parliament to exercise and fill its jurisdiction over those policy areas which have been agreed as devolved and to have full authority on how decisions will be made on those devolved related powers that are transferred back from the EU once the UK leaves. So it is a matter of profound disappointment and regret that we are having this debate. As Neil Finlay also said, the Scottish Labour Party believes that the Tory UK government should, as a matter of urgency, bring forward amendments to its bill to avoid us having to consider our alternatives. But in the meantime, the challenge for us is to consider what those alternatives might be. The conflicting legal opinions expressed by the presiding officer and the Lord Advocate illustrate the complexities of these issues and highlight the potential for this bill to be challenged in the courts. We are in uncharted territory and it is not comfortable for this parliament to be disagreeing with advice from its presiding Officers, yeah, taking that down, sir. Bruce Crawford. The issue of challenging um, legislation passed in this place in the courts. It's, it's of course true that any legislation that we pass in this in this place can be challenged in a court at any time. Neil Bibby. I accept that, uh, uh, 
uh, Bruce Crawford, but we're not discussing any legislation and not any legislation uh, uh, receives advice from the resigning officer saying it is not competent. So we need to tread very carefully and make sure that this unprecedented bill is being rigorously tested for competence, content and effect. Probably more so than any other bill ever scrutinised by this Parliament, we need to demonstrate that it is not a political stunt or an overreaction to an incompetent and intransigent Tory government. As a starting point, it would be helpful if both the presiding officer and the Scottish Government were to publish their respective legal advice. The Law Society of Scotland have said it would be in the public interest. This is an exceptional bill and these are exceptional times. In these exceptional circumstances, it is surely in the public interest that the relevant legal opinion is put into the public domain. In exceptional circumstances, the ministerial code is clear uh, that this is allowed. This Parliament should be able to reflect on the arguments both for and against the competence of the bill. Presiding officer, the Parliament has been asked to give legislation that is entirely without precedent, the maximum scrutiny in limited time. The, in these circumstances, it is incumbent on the Scottish Government to cooperate with the Parliament and provide the assurances that members require before making an informed decision about the bill, particularly at stage two and stage three. I asked the Minister this morning about the 25 areas of disagreement over competencies between the UK Government and the Scottish Government, which we are to understand are one of the principal reasons this bill has been brought forward. But the Parliament and the public still do not know what those 25 areas are. The Minister hopes to provide that information in advance of stage two, and he will raise it at the meeting tomorrow we heard earlier. But as I told the Minister this morning, I can see no reason why we should not have this information now and before us today. And it's not just Scottish Labour that are saying that. In evidence to the Finance and Constitution Committee this morning, Professor Alan Page described the Scottish Government's position on this as not satisfactory. Professor Kirsty Hughes said that having knowledge of those 25 areas would be desirable. I would therefore ask the Scottish Government to reflect on their position and publish this information to the Parliament and, more importantly, to the public. Section 13 of the Bill, as has been discussed, empowers ministers, Scot Scottish ministers to make provision corresponding to EU law following our exit. Already there has been considerable debate about this section of the bill. It has significant powers to Scottish ministers. It would allow the Scottish Government to implement laws in Scotland which correspond to EU law, even if that EU law takes effect after exit date. There has been a lot of debate about it, and uh, we heard evidence again at the Finance and Constitution Committee this morning. The Law Society says that this section of the bill lacks clarity. Also, the, earlier today, Professor Aileen McHard of Strathclyde University alluded to the confusion about whether this is a keeping pace power or whether it is included in the bill for some other reason that would be harder to justify. And another witness, Professor Page, warned that this amounts to a potentially major surrender by the Parliament of its legislative competence and called it a thoroughly bad idea. And I think we should take heed of those uh, serious warnings. The UK government's withdrawal bill has been rightly described as a power grab, not just because of its dispute with the devolved administrations, but because it could also allow the executive uh, to sideline the UK parliament. Just as the role of parliament must be respected by the UK government, so too must the role of this parliament be respected by the Scottish government. The minister must listen and address the concerns that have been expressed about this section in particular of the bill going forward. And I'm pleased to hear Patrick Harvey saying that the Greens are open-minded uh, on, on amendments uh, in this area as well. I think that's very important. Presiding officer, like others on the Labour benches, I have reservations about this bill, reservations about the rushed nature of the bill, the time, limited time available for consultation, and the power it would put in the hands of ministers rather than the hands of the parliament. But I will support the bill at decision time today. We are in uncharted territory. Fundamental principles underpinning the devolution settlement are at stake. Doing nothing has, is not an option. If the UK Tory government will not amend the U sorry, UK you must withdrawal conclude bill right now. to take account of the concerns right expressed by all parties, now. Sorry, then Mr. we must Bibby. be prepared Thank you very to much. Thank I you. call Kate Forbes, followed by Joan McAlpine. Presiding officer, and I'm never quite sure whether to do it, but I am the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary for the Finance and the Constitution. In last Thursday's debate, Joanne Lamont commented that we have a tendency to forget the one million people in Scotland who voted leave. And as a Democrat, I have some sympathy with that view, not because I necessarily agree with them, but because I have a responsibility to represent my constituents. And so I'm pleased that this debate can unite all voters, because I also agree with Alex Neil that it is not about Brexit. It's about the existing powers of this parliament and it's about protecting the devolution settlement 
that people in Scotland voted for so decisively in 1997, and I won't tell anyone what age I was then. As a Democrat, I think that this Parliament is, a, is responsible for representing the wishes and aspirations of the people of Scotland. We have a responsibility to protect our country's interests and freedoms and to advance policies and strategies which make Scotland safer, fairer and more prosperous. I happen to think that that's what Scotland's MPs should be doing too. All 59 MPs of different parties and the Secretary of State for Scotland and the Prime Minister, none of whom should need to be convinced or persuaded to respect the devolution settlement or to honour their promises or to provide satisfactory answers on the economy, on the long-term rights of EU nationals or on the future border arrangements in Ireland, to name just three. And the challenge for all MSPs in this Parliament in the fallout of the Brexit vote is the sense of powerlessness, despite the best determined efforts of the Scottish Government, a government which has published several papers on Scotland's place in Europe and whose public analysis has been far more comprehensive than the government who is actually tasked with negotiating on our future. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance Local Government in the Welsh Assembly summarised the entire predicament by saying that Clause 11, and I quote, rolls back devolution. It says that for an indefinite period of time and to an extent that the UK government cannot explain to us, powers that we have had since the start of devolution will be taken back to Westminster and at some future date eked back out to us. It's been said by Mr Tompkins and others that this bill is unnecessary and perhaps it would be if his colleagues would get their act together, respect the fears in this parliament and across Scotland and Wales for the devolution settlement and face up to the responsibility of furthering the interests of this country and not undermining them. This, there has been and continues to be an option for the UK government to resolve what is unanimously accepted as unacceptable. There were promises that Brexit would actually lead to more powers for Scotland, followed by promises to accept amendments to protect the devolution settlement. But regrettably, despite those promises, the UK government firstly failed to bring forward an amendment in the House of Commons, and although it has finally put a proposal on the table, this amendment would still allow the UK government to restrict the Scottish Parliament's powers unilaterally through an order made in the UK Parliament. That is what is putting everything in jeopardy, not this continuity bill. And so the continuity bill will come into effect if the Scottish Parliament decides not to grant consent to the EU withdrawal bill because, and this is critical, because to do so would be to abandon our responsibilities, our collective responsibilities, the responsibility of anybody who has ever been elected to this Parliament and will be elected in the future, our collective responsibility to represent and to further the interests and freedoms of the people of Scotland. Tavish Scott mentioned the need for some UK-wide frameworks and the Scottish Government has always been clear that they accept in principle the need for some UK frameworks on certain matters. But what is covered by a UK framework and how they are governed must only be made with the agreement of this Scottish Parliament. It is not acceptable within this devolution settlement and also in the, in the terms of how the nations of the United Kingdom operate together to rewrite the devolution settlement and impose UK-wide frameworks in devolved areas without consent. And so I finish where I started. There are disagreements about the rights and wrongs, the risks and benefits, the pros and cons of Brexit. There are always have been and there, these will continue. This debate is about the cross-party agreement inside and outside the chamber that we have a responsibility as members of the Scottish Parliament to represent and further the interests of Scotland. And we will not sign away that responsibility, no matter how temporarily. Thank you. I call Joan McAlpine to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Ms McAlpine, please. Thank you. I, I think uh, Bruce Crawford, MSP, hit the nail on the head today when he asked the Scottish Conservatives, whose side are you on? 
uh, he generously conceded in his speech that Scottish Conservatives were now supporters of this parliament, having been on the wrong side of the campaign to establish it in 1997. Uh, that campaign resulted in a 74% yes vote to reconvene the Scottish Parliament, something that uh, is worth um, reflecting on when you consider the destruction that's been wrought uh, on uh, this country and indeed the whole UK uh, with a 52% leave vote across the UK as a whole. Um, Jackson Carlaw, I think, was deserving of Mr Crawford's generosity. In his speech, he said he wanted the two governments to reach an agreement. But although the tone of his speech was very conciliatory and measured, it concerned me that he equated the desire uh, that the devolved governments should consent to this intervention in their power. Uh, he, he suggested that was the equivalent of a veto. Uh, to describe consent as a veto is to quote the word in a veneer of hostility in my view and I couldn't help but note that um, Michelle Ballantyne MSP also used the word veto today when her and I conducted an interview with ITV Border this morning so that suggests to me that the concern expressed by Alec Neil that there's a very hostile briefing emanating from the UK Conservatives um, which is deeply confrontational to, uh, to devolution is somewhere out there now I don't think that Jack Jackson Carlaw for a moment is hostile to devolution or or this parliament. Uh, as a member of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee, he signed up to our Brexit report's conclusion, which I've quoted before, but I make no apologies for quoting again. And that conclusion said, we believe that any power, currently a competence of the EU, that is to be repatriated after Brexit and which is not currently listed in Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act 1998 should be fully devolved alongside a funding mechanism resulting in no detriment to Scotland. Of course, this has not happened. And the Scottish Conservatives... Yes? Michelle Ballantyne. You were saying very clearly that you don't think that consent constitutes a veto. So if the Scottish Parliament or the Northern Irish Parliament or the Welsh Parliament didn't give consent to something, what do you call that? Joan McAlpine. <laughs> well, I call that not giving consent. <laughs> um, I want to turn uh, to the justification <laughs> that the Scottish Conservatives have brought forward to justify this act of vandalism against this Parliament. They repeatedly suggest that uh, only uh, by staging this power grab can they ensure free trade continues across the UK itself. But as the Minister uh, Michael Russell said to this chamber last week, there is no single market in the UK as the UK government has presented it. There's a uniform market, we all trade together, but we have different arrangements when those are required and when the powers of this Parliament or those of the Welsh Assembly make that necessary. As the Minister noticed, there's considerable diversity within the UK right now. Uh, corporation taxes uh, in Northern Ireland and income and property taxes here, the ban on fracking here, minimum alcohol pricing, and critically, our refusal to open up the Scottish NHS to market principles, as in England. The European single market, which the Tories are set on leaving, has a single set of rules that are interpreted and enforced by member states with the European Court of Justice as the final arbiter. And it allows divergences. So long as states fit into the overall structure, trade can be maintained. The Scottish Government considers that there are likely to be fields where its policy will be, at least immediately following UK withdrawal, voluntarily to maintain regulatory alignment with EU rules. And this will mean choosing to keep pace with developments in a particular field of regulation after UK withdrawal. If the UK chooses otherwise, uh, we would be allowed to do this. The EU single market gives a huge amount of flexibility to Parliament, such as this one, while allowing for fair and free trade across the borders of various member states. And I think this is a cr critically important point. The EU single market has an entire set of institutions and bodies dedicated to its maintenance, bodies which are jointly controlled by the members themselves. There is currently no mechanism like this in the UK. Uh, if the JMC process is... Um, is a mechanism, goodness help us all, because that has clearly not delivered anything like respect uh, for the devolved settlement. And that is why we're facing the dilemmas we do now. We must now construct a series of frameworks to govern how we can make law. Central to this will either be this bill or one from the UK government. 
Thus far, the UK government has had many warm words which are welcome but little concrete action. And this Parliament's Constitution Committee concluded unanimously that Clause 11 was incompatible with the devolution settlement, yet it still stands. It is obvious that many of the areas currently controlled by the EU have the potential to be viewed very differently by the Scottish Government and the UK Government in absolute terms and in interpretation. One pertinent example is the cultivation of uh, GMOs. This is regulated at EU level under the Deliberate Release Directive and from 2015 has been possible to restrict the cultivation of such crops. We in Scotland enjoy the benefits of this and have, along with 19 member states, en ended the cultivation of GMOs here in Scotland. The Welsh and the Northern Irish governments joined us, though England did not. Where will we stand post-Brexit? I wish I'm I afraid, or frankly, I'm afraid, the UK I'm afraid you must conclude. could answer. Thank and you. That is no, just one no, reason you must conclude. The power you must of conclude. This please sit down. Thank you. I call Mike Rumbles, please. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officers. Now, several members in this debate have made much about protecting the powers of our Parliament in this bill. That is indeed the intention of the bill, and that is why I will be supporting the general principles in the stage one vote tonight. However, our job as MSPs is to scrutinise the detail of the bill. After all, the devil is always in the detail, and oh boy, is there a devil in this detail. We should be protecting the powers of our parliament. Section 13 takes real power away from our young parliament and delivers it. It delivers it to ministers. I just quote one. Regulations in the subsection one may make any provision, any provision that could be made by an act of the Scottish Parliament. I can't believe it is protecting the powers of our Parliament by giving ministers this power for up to 15 years to create, for instance, new public authorities, with MSPs, with us, being only allowed to say yes or no. Section 13 undermines the powers of this Parliament, and it fundamentally shifts powers from Parliament to ministers. Could I ask genuinely all those MSPs who've said in this debate that this bill is about protecting the powers of our Scottish Parliament, if you haven't already done so, and I know, I hope most of us have, but I'm sure if you haven't already done so, please read section 13 in full. And unless section 13 is removed from the bill in stages two or three, and I'll certainly be putting down amendments if other people don't, these MSPs, our MS, those MSPs, like myself and others, who are genuinely concerned about protecting the powers of the Parliament, will not be able to vote in stage three. I will, but if I have time. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to Mike Rumbles for giving way. Neither he nor I wished this Brexit crisis to come about, but we do recognise the extraordinary job of legislative heavy lifting that will be required if we are in fact taken out of the European Union. Is it his view that that can be done entirely with primary legislation and not with order making powers at all? Briefly, Mr Rumbles. No, it can be done with both. What we mustn't see over the next 15 years is our powers of primary legislation being taken away. And that's the whole point of, of section. No, it's, it's 15, read the bill properly. Yes, we only can say yes or no. For goodness sake, five and five and five is 15. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you very much, Mr Rumbles. Uh, we move to closing speeches now, and I call on James Kelly. Uh, thank you, uh, presiding officer. Uh, like many speakers in the debate, I sympathise with the view that it's regrettable that we're, we're here this afternoon um, having to consider this legislation. And essentially, as many have pointed out, it's as a result of failure to resolve the issues around the, the EU withdrawal bill, um, specifically Clause 11. Um, there's a general view in the Parliament that uh, powers coming from the EU that relate to uh, the Scottish Parliament should, sh should reside in the Scottish Parliament. And it's that issue that's, that, that's been of debate around the EU withdrawal bill. And regrettably, um, because of internal differences in the Conservative Party, that issue has not been able to, to be resolved. Uh, as Neil Finlay pointed out, you know, going back um, to before the turn of the year, we heard a number of statements from Conservative politicians in Scotland that, you know, that this issue could be resolved. 
and they would work constructively to bring amendments. But when the time came on the 10th of January, that passed without any amendments uh, being tabled, uh, and that's precipitated the, 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 the crisis that we see today. And from that point of view, um, the, uh, the, the, the devolution settlement uh, was under threat, and the purpose of bringing forward this legislation from the government uh, is to protect that devolution settlement. From that point of view, we'll support those general principles. However, I did have a, a wry smile to the, the number of SNP backbenchers uh, who have made uh, sort of speeches, you know, being champions of devolution. Uh, it was only this time last year that we debated having a second independence referendum and the speeches from those benches were about uh, ripping up that devolution settlement. The, there was a number of, um, there was a number of uh, issues come out during the, the course of the debate. Obviously, one of the, the challenges here is legislative competence and the fact that we have a different view from the presiding officer's legal advice to that from the, the Lord Advocate, uh, which uh, has, has issued his certificate in support of the government's position. And listening to some of the speeches across the chamber, uh, people were kind of picking uh, what legal advice suited their political argument. Um, so Christina McKelvey favoured the Lord Advocate's position and Rachel Hamilton uh, favoured the presiding officer's position. I think what that shows is it puts us in a, uh, as MSPs, it puts us in an uncharted territory and it puts us in a difficult position because this is the first time we've had a position where the presiding officer has not issued a, a, a well, ex with the exception of Sandra White's members bill, uh, it's th this is the only occasion where the presiding officer has not issued a certificate of legislative competence and it's obviously serious that uh, his view is different from the Lord Advocate's view. And, you know, I think it's important to try and resolve that issue during this process. We don't want to end up in a position where uh, we're in the courts. I think from that point of view, as Neil Bibby pointed out, uh, I know it's not the normal position of either the presiding officer or the government to publish legal advice. But I think in this instance, given the, the gravity of the situation, I think both the presiding officer and the government should consider the publication of that legal advice. Uh, Claire Baker was right to point out the challenges around scrutiny, scrutiny and transparency. It's already clear from this debate that this is complex legislation and it's going to, there, there's going to be a lot of amendments coming forward uh, at stage two. The deadline for stage two amendments is Friday and then we're going to be here in stage two uh, next Tuesday, which is only six days away. Um, and I think that, you know, truncated... Uh, process is something that is of, you know, uh, real concern. I mean, added to that, the fact that there have been repeated calls during this debate and also the different committees that Mr. Russell has attended to publish the 25 areas where there's a disagreement between the Scottish Government and the UK Government as to what powers should be passed to the Scottish Parliament. I think it's difficult for parliamentarians to uh, formulate appropriate amendments when there are, there are areas that are central to the debate that aren't, uh, that, that aren't fully transparent and uh, before us as uh, MSPs. Uh, yes, Stuart McMillan. Stuart McMillan. Thank James Kelly for taking the intervention, but I'm sure uh, James Kelly would agree with me that, that no MSP should have been surprised that there was a possibility of a continuity bill actually coming forward to this chamber because of the actions and inactions of the UK government. James Kelly. No, I, I made that point, but now that, we're actually, now that we're actually in the process, as parliamentarians, there's a real challenge uh, as to how we work our way through these issues. Uh, if we stick to the timetable over the next two weeks, there's issues around legislative competence. There's serious challenges around scrutiny and transparency. We've heard from different members, Mike Rumble's raised concerns about the, uh, the regulations passed to ministers in relation to six, uh, Section 13, and there, there are concerns that there's too much power in the hands of ministers there. Similarly, Patrick Harvey spoke about Section 17 and consent uh, in relation to subordinate legislation. Um, there's also the issue about retained EU law that Graham Simpson raised and the, p the potential that that will undermine legal certainty. 
Uh, and also, and I know the Minister has said that he's committed to addressing this, but I think Section 28 and the ambiguity around the exit day definition uh, is one that also has to be addressed. Uh, in summing up, Presiding Officer, uh, this bill presents real difficult challenges uh, for the Parliament, as I said, around legislative competence, scrutiny uh, and some of the issues. Um, I think, listening to the debate, I think uh, I agree with both what Alec Neil and Neil Finlay said in that there's a real challenge here for the Tories to resolve their internal differences and to help come up with a solution to this. Because otherwise, we're in a position where, as parliamentarians, we have to navigate a very difficult parliamentary process, which there are legal issues around. And we could end up uh, with, uh, even if the bill is passed, with it being in the hands of the courts. And that's something that nobody wants. We want a resolution that, uh, retains, that retains the devolved powers where they should be in the Scottish Parliament. Thank you. And I call on Donald Cameron to wind up for the Conservative Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At stage one, we're generally uh, used to a consensual discussion here in the Chamber. Stage one is, of course, the stage where usually parties attempt to avoid head-on confrontation as they agree or tend to agree on the general principles of the bill, simply to allow it to be scrutinised in more detail at stages two and three, where the technical specifics of our amendments are debated. But not today, Presiding Officer. We will be voting against this at stage one. Let me begin with the subject of legislative competence. This is a bill which you, presiding officer, has deemed to be beyond the competence of this legislature. And yet, you have been ignored by the Scottish Government, yeah. who charge on regardless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For the first time in the history of this parliament, the significance of this should be lost on no one. The devolution settlement is enshrined in the Scotland Act, 1998. That act is a remarkable, historic document. It's the act that gave birth to this place, this institution, this parliament. And Tom Arthur and Bruce Crawford talked about it, and I, I agree with them in terms of the special nature of that act, although I disagree with them about many of the conclusions they drew. But the architects of that legislation, who carefully designed it, who understood the nuances of devolution, and who calibrated the delicate balance between reserved and devolved authority, mm -hmm. and the sensitivities, sensitivities involved, created something of wonder. It's not perfect. No act is, but it has led to remarkably little litigation and legal con controversy. The concept of legislative competence is paramount to that. Section 29 of the Act says that a Scottish Parliament Act is not law as far as any provision is outside competence. The Supreme Court has said this lies at the heart of the scheme of devolution to which the Act gives effect. Anything outside competence is not law, it's simple, basic, raw fact. And as we all know, presiding officer, the Act provides for you to give your ruling on legislative competence. Yes, I will. Drew McAlpine. Given the context of his remarks, whether he would like to remark on uh, the comments by Lord Hope, the former Deputy President of the Supreme Court, who said that the EU withdrawal bill had a touch of Cromwell about it. Donald Cameron. The members of these benches have been on, uh, are on record as saying that Clause 11 is not fit for purpose, yeah. and I don't, don't dispute that at all. Yeah, exactly. But in terms of, in terms of the, the, the Act, presiding officer, the Act expressly provides for you to give your ruling on competence. It doesn't merely provide, it mandates, it's compulsory. Mm -hmm. You shall give your view. Why should you give your view, presiding officer? Is it a courtesy, a mere convention? Or could it be that legislators saw the need for the leader of this parliament, the person elected by us all to head up this institution, the presiding officer, to be the guardian of what this parliament legislates upon. Exactly. According to the Supreme Court, these sections, no, I, I want to make progress. According to the Supreme Court, these sections are designed to ensure that the Scottish parliament confines itself to the defined areas of competence. Yep. Section 31 is entitled scrutiny of bills. It could not be plainer. Your ruling on legislative competence is about scrutiny. It's about examining and auditing the legislation that is introduced here. Presiding officer, you are the gatekeeper. And so last week, unequivocally and explicitly, you stated this bill falls outside legislative competence. And yet the government plows on regardless, turning the Scotland Act on its head by obstinately persisting with this bill in a way that is both unnecessary 
and unprecedented. Bruce Crawford. Bruce Crawford. Would, the member, would the member also accept that the architects of the Scotland Act were clever enough to make sure that in the design of the Scotland Act, that it was also the capacity of the government of the day to submit a bill for discussion in Parliament, despite a ruling from the presiding officer that it was out of competence. And that's actually the situation we're in in reality today. Donald Cameron. Well, the, ex the explanatory notes to the Act say that it is something that this Parliament should take into account during the passage of a bill that you describe. And the Lord Advocate can set out the legal views of the government as he did last week. There's absolutely no procedural requirement for him, to, for him to do so. Unprecedented again. But not content with these new departures, the Scottish Government goes further and goes faster. Last week we are told that this is to be emergency legislation, going against the grain of every emergency bill passed so far. That remains a disgrace, with every other party here complicit in that decision and landing us, landing us with this farcical timetable to consider fundamental legislation on the Constitution in the space of a mere three days. No, I'm sorry, I don't have time. Labour and the Lib Dems piously expressed concern today, but they voted for it and for this timetable. Yeah. We've heard complaints from the SNP before about not having enough time to read the Brexit impact papers. We've heard complaints that the House of Commons hasn't had time to debate amendments on the UK bill. Any complaints about a three-day timetable for one of the most radical constitutional bills before this parliament, not a whisper from the SNP benches. This isn't respecting the devolution settlement, it's discrediting it. This isn't defending the Scottish parliament, it's attacking its very foundations. I'd like to turn to the bill in its detail, presiding officer. The Scottish government's very own policy memorandum says it will add complexity and present serious logistical challenges a bill where no formal consultation was possible prior to its introduction. But if ever there was a need for consultation, this is it. If ever there was a need for detailed evidence, oral or written, from professional bodies, from the third sector, from the vast array of people and members of the public who could be affected, this is it. Yeah. And there are serious concerns that the bill goes beyond that of the UK bill on the matter of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. This bill incorporates it directly into Scots law as it applies to devolved matters, while it is accepted from incorporation by the UK Bill. The Law Society of Scotland argued that where this takes a fundamentally different approach, the Scottish Government should be permissive with suggestions to improve or clarify the Bill as it passes through the Parliament, and I hope they've taken note of that. Hi, Neil. Can I ask him the core question at the heart of where the Tory party is? What today is Tory party policy? Is it still to transfer the outstanding 25 powers back to this parliament or to keep them in Westminster? What is your party policy? Donald Cameron. I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. <laughs> I will, I will, I will, yeah. I will. The Law Society of Scotland noted this bill introduces new categories of law like retained devolved EU law, which may make it more difficult to be certain about the law. So the SPICE briefing on Section 4 talks about it being not being clear which rights will be captured by that section. Uh, section 13 of this bill has been mentioned before. It provides powers to the ministers to make regulations to ensure that, where appropriate, Scots law and devolved areas can continue to keep pace with EU law after the UK has left the European Union. There is currently no comparable clause in the UK bill. The 15 years nature of, of one of the subsections is of grave concern. Mike Rumbles is absolutely right. It undermines this parliament. Yeah. All of these points, and there are others, and I'm sure we'll come to them in the later stages of the bill, point to the fact that the bill does not complement or coincide with the UK bill. It's something quite different, and that has to be acknowledged. This has all the makings of a constitutional and legal minefield. Yeah. I can sense every lawyer in the land rubbing their hands in glee. <laughs> so many issues, presiding officer, so little time. And on the subject of time, the real tragedy, and this is what Jackson Carlaw was right about, the real tragedy is the timing of this bill. Negotiations are at a crucial, delicate stage. The two governments are close to agreement, close but with an enormous, important issue to determine. And at this sensitive moment, at the very moment when maintaining trust between governments is at its most critical, what happens out of nowhere, the SNP give us this bill? So, Alec Neil, to answer your point, everyone, everyone, everyone agreed that Clause 11 was unfit for purpose. 
Everyone accepted the need for common frameworks. Everyone accepted, everyone was striving to, to reach an agreement, and the bill drives a coach and horses yeah. through that yeah. today. No, I don't, no, no, no. Now, the UK government have made a big concession in relation to the immediate devolution of powers. This was a major move towards the SNP. It marks a substantive change in position. And the SNP face a choice. Either they can focus on these discussions in good faith, which are coming to a head, or they can continue to play games with the Constitution. So there we have it, presiding officer. A bill out with our powers. A presiding officer defied and a parliament stripped of time to adequately scrutinize this legislation. What a mess. On these benches, we'll have no truck with the SNP's game playing. We will oppose this irresponsible lawmaking. We will support a sensible deal on Brexit that brings more powers back to Scotland. And above all else, we'll oppose this wretched wrecking bill at decision time. Well and I call on the Minister, Michael Russell, to wind up the debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm very conscious of a number of themes that have emerged this afternoon. I want to treat them carefully, uh, but I want to start with a, uh, as I often do, with a quotation, and it is from John Mahaffey, the um, UK ambassador to Ireland in the Second World War. And he, um, he said, I think rather wryly at one stage, looking at Ireland and the difficulties it had and the language that was used, phrases make history here. It actually also happens to be the title of a very good book of Irish political quotations. And what John Mahaffey meant was he had to be careful in difficult circumstances. He had to make sure that you did not make those circumstances worse and that you tried to use accurate and careful language to describe where you were in order that you might make some progress. And I say that because I am concerned that the language that has come particularly from the Tory front bench today, and also from some of the backbenches. And I want to just make clear the difficulties that are being caused by that and the inaccuracy that's within it. Ruth Davidson said over the weekend in an interview on television, I was on the subsequent interview, I, however, was in a snowstorm. Ruth Davidson, I think, was indoors during the interview. She said that the, uh, the SNP government had rammed through emergency legislation. This chamber voted, this chamber voted 86 to 27 in a democratic vote. You cannot use those words accurately. Secondly, uh, Rachel Hamilton said that rushed legislation was always bad legislation and pointed to the example of the Land Reform Bill. Well, I was on the committee of the Land Reform Bill. There were two years of consultation, two years of consultation, and then nine months uh, between introduction and royal assent. Now, I understand that Rachel Hamilton does not like the Land Reform Bill. She does not like land reform, like many of those sitting around her. They feel threatened by land reform. I wonder why. But the reality is that was not a rushed piece of legislation. And then we've actually seen other examples here. Adam Tompkins' account of this morning's meeting of the committee and the evidence of the Law Society, uh, I think, uh, at the very least, could be uh, uh, challenged. And it would be challenged simply by looking at the video of that evidence being given because there was a very constructive discussion on a whole range of issues. But also, there was other evidence given. It wasn't simply the Law Society turning up and saying, you know, woe is me. There were many discussions. Let's take, for example, Section 5 on general principles and the Charter. The bill has made clear steps to improve the position in the UK bill, keeping the Charter in Scots law. And indeed, in other evidence, in exactly that same se uh, session, Professor Aileen McHarg very clearly pointed out that effective remedies to the problems that were raised by Professor Tompkins are within the bill. So presenting these issues in the accurate way is extremely important. And I suppose the nadir we got to, although I, I do regret Donald Cameron's use of language, uh, the word disgrace, the description of the uh, Liberal Democrats as pious, that doesn't help us trying to discuss this carefully. And the nadir was, of course, uh, Mr. Golden, yeah. who, who used the word illegal, who used the words wildcat legislation. Strangely enough, words that occurred in a press release from uh, Mr. Cameron uh, earlier today. Clearly, there has been some collusion on the choice of words. This is not illegal. The, the, the legislation creates exactly the circumstances and anticipates the circumstances we are in. 
there are remedies for those circumstances. So I just, I think it is a really important to make that point clear. Freezes do make history. And if we're going to debate and discuss in what are difficult times, resolution that we have to find, let's try and do so with a level of accuracy uh, rather than what we have heard this afternoon. And if we're going to do it, let's also not mistell our history. Uh, of course, we all took different positions at various times uh, on the Constitutional Convention, and all of us did different things. Uh, Mr. Arthur was said, uh, he was, and uh, Mr. Golden were too young to vote in the 1997 referendum. I ran the SNP campaign, but I also ran it jointly with Andy Miles from the Liberal Democrats and Jack McConnell from Labour. So there was, of course, a working together in the Yes, yes campaign. But let's, then, well, then let's move on to the key question, let's move on to the key question, which is not what we necessarily did in those referenda. Let's talk about the key question of what we would do now. And that's the point that Bruce Crawford raised, very importantly. What would we do now? Do we put the interests of devolution, the devolved settlement, in, in the forefront of our minds, or do we, do, we, do we put something else at the forefront of our mind, whether it be shouting, in the case of Professor Tompkins, or party advantage. So let's look at that very carefully. Now let me turn to some of the issues of detail before I come to the point I want to conclude on. On the issues of detail, I am, and I've made that clear from the very beginning of this process, I will go on making it clear, open to discussion, debate, and of course the bill is open to amendment, as I've indicated to Mr. Rumbles at the start of this and make it clear here. And if there are defects in any of the clauses that members are passionate about, and clearly Mr. Rumbles is passionate about Clause 13, then amendments can be brought forward and discussed in the normal way. And indeed, and I again pay tribute to the, the, the Bureau and to all those who are involved, we have a system developed which will allow that to happen, and I hope happen well. But I am also happy to argue for Section 13. I have to say that the wording is directly drawn from the existing uh, provisions in EU law in the European Communities Act 1972. I know I really, really have to make progress on this, I'm sorry. Um, uh, and, and therefore, we believe that that power continues to be appropriate in certain circumstances. But if we have to define those circumstances more closely, if there have to be constraints upon those circumstances that the Chamber wishes to see, that's an entirely legitimate aspiration to bring forward those amendments and let us debate and discuss them, and I hope we will. And there are a range of other issues raised today uh, which can be addressed either in evidence at stage two or in the willingness I've shown to uh, discuss this with any individual member or, or any grouping or even to be addressed at stage three. So we have a whole range of ways of dealing with the detail of the bill and we should do so using accurate language and with a determination that no matter the views of people whether or not we should be here that we try and get the best legislation possible. But the heart of this issue, presiding officer, is this, and it come, came in two succeeding speeches this afternoon. It came from Mr. Carlaw and Alec Neal. Uh, and I commend both of them, though I disagree with Mr. Carlaw and I agree with Alec Neal. But I do commend both those speeches. Now, I fear that Jackson Carlaw may even unwittingly have taken us back in this debate rather than us forward, whereas Alec Neal has tried to take us forward. He will recognize this is a case of respicky, prospicky, something that he himself talks about often, the motto of his old school. And Kate Forbes and Neil Finlay made exactly the same point. Now, tomorrow we, will tomorrow we will have to address the substantive issue of whether we can get an agreement. And if the UK government have dug themselves into a position where they cannot accept the basic principle, and Kate Forbes made it, not to sign away our responsibilities. Mark Drakeford made it, and she quoted Mark Drakeford in this, not to sign away our responsibilities in this cha chamber. If, we, if the UK government is determined not to do that, then there cannot be an agreement. But if, as Alec Neal has indicated, there is the possibility of finding in the middle there some way in which we can accept the devolved settlement, which is the devolved settlement, can't be wished away. If the UK government wished to alter the devolved settlement, they must come with primary legislation to alter the devolved settlement. But if there is some way to do so, and Alec Neal has indicated some of those ways, then it can be found. Presiding officer, a final point, if I might. I was concerned with Adam Tompkins' uh, presentation of the issue of the Sewell Convention. It had eerie echoes of Jacob Rees-Mogg on the Irish border, blaming the issue on the Irish border on the EU, not on the Brexiteers. Now let me make it absolutely clear. The Sewell Convention should apply and should go on applying. 
and nobody in this chamber, I hope, believes otherwise. And if there is any attempt to argue, as appeared to be the case, that in some sense we had sold the pass on the Seoul Convention, let me put that to one side now. Let me put that firmly and clearly. Don't blame the victim for the crime. The reality of this situation is the Seoul Convention applies and should combine, and it would be. It would be an extreme step, the type of step I hope that's not be anticipated by Mr. Carlo in his speech. It would be an extreme step if what was to happen was that convention was to be abandoned by the UK government. For, uh, Mr. Mr. Tompkins simply keeps shouting. I, I've tried to indicate I think that's the inappropriate way to deal with these issues. The appropriate way to these issues is to have the type of debate that he was involved in this morning, where there was constructive debate in the committee. And I don't know what he had for his lunch, but clearly it didn't agree with him. <laughs> now, let me finish, presiding officer, by simply saying this. I will go into tomorrow's discussions in London, as I know Mark Drakeford will, and I spoke to him at lunchtime today, hopeful, positive, and purposeful. But we will be judged in the end by the chambers to which we report. And the judgment will come on that key issue, as Kate Forbes indicated to it. Have we made sure that we stand up for and do not trade away the responsibilities and rights of this parliament? Or have we found some weakness within ourselves that does not allow us to do it? I believe we should stand up for the rights of this parliament because that's standing up for the rights of the people of Scotland. But I go in to negotiate, absolutely determined to try and find a way to get an agreement. Thank you. That concludes our stage one debate. The next item of business is consideration of motion 10784 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution for the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. And I would call on Derek Mackay to move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you very much. The next item of business is consideration of a business motion 10838 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. Uh, could I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 10838? Formally moved. Can I ask if any member wishes to speak against this motion? No. In that case, uh, the question is that motion 10838 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Thank you very much. We come now to decision time. The first question is that motion 10817 in the name of Michael Russell on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill at stage one be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on motion 10817 in the name of Michael Russell is yes 94, no 30, there were no abstentions, the motion is therefore agreed. I would just point out that uh, because this is an emergency bill procedure and the Parliament has agreed to the general principles of the bill, stage two amendments should be lodged by 2pm this Friday, that's Friday the 9th of March at 2pm. The next question is that motion 10784 in the name of Derek Mackay and a financial resolution for the continuity bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division again and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 10784 in the name of Derek Mackay is yes 94, no 30. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business in the name of Stuart Stevenson on electronic and internet voting. We'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats.